Okay, I had time to rehearse my speech, so um, now I'll do it a second time. <laughs> Very welcome this morning here, the Argonaut Observatory, one of the oldest public observatories that we have in Germany. My name is Monica Stescher. I'm the director of the planetarium at the Insulana Hill and the Wilhelm First Observatory, which is one of the three institutions of the Stiftung Planetarium Berlin. Stiftung Planetarium Berlin consists of the Argonaut Observatory as the oldest one. Then we have my planetarium and the observatory since the 1960s and a second large planetarium since the mid 1980s in the eastern part of the city in Prenzlauer Berg. And on behalf of our board, Florian Horn, which has a hell, who has a hell of a headache this morning, and so asked me to do these introductions. It was a very pleasant surprise that I came to talk this morning and not only work on my uh, laptop. So very well, well, all welcome. I am very pleased that I can be here and introduce this wonderful kind of festival. For me personally, it has never been um, not a connection between art and science since I read and do music. And for me, it's never been something that cannot go together in a certain way. Also, if we have pop culture, if we have such things as uh, Star Trek and all this stuff. And so um, that art and space come together is something very special. And I'm glad it can be here at this place. This place where we ended up people also Einstein stood and talked about his famous theory of relativity, which also in a certain way today, because everyone knows about it, or seems to know about it, or thinks to know about it, and uh, that also connects in a certain way, also art and space. And so I hope you have a very pleasant three days with a lot of interesting people and a lot of interesting lectures. And so I'd like to welcome Sabina. And who's the next one in line? Yeah. Okay, and you? Yeah, but most, most of us. Yeah, thank you very much. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I know it was a little bit of uh, mulling around, but I know it's about 45 minutes that we'll be standing here. <laughs> Excellent. So, um, yeah, thank you very much <laughs> for uh, the welcome. And I think we are so pleased to be uh, here in Berlin, yeah. Yeah. a city of uh, space, uh, astronomy, research and culture, and also, of course, of art and political city, a lot of history. And so we are very, very proud and pleased to be here. Also in this beautiful place, uh, Aschenhold, Stalwarte Observatory. So good. So we are looking forward Thank to you. come back. Thank you, Monica. Thank you. So um, hello, uh, welcome to uh, Space Renaissance. Uh, I am uh, Bernard Franz, so I'm uh, serving as the president of Space Renaissance International, but also I come uh, from a background. Um, we, we have a, a group we call Your Moon Mars. So these are researchers and uh, students and uh, fanatics of uh, exploration of the Moon and Mars. And uh, I, we came this morning with a battalion of young professionals also that serve as uh, volunteers. And uh, we were greeted in this beautiful place here, Archenhold uh, Observatory. Uh, for those of you that uh, uh, did not have yet uh, the chance to visit, uh, we are going to share some uh, beautiful views of the, uh, of the exhibition. There will be also demonstration. Uh, and I encourage you to come again here uh, after this teaser of this uh, uh, Space Renaissance uh, Art and Science uh, Festival. Um, so we have, a, uh, uh, as you know, Space Renaissance International. It's a, it's a foundation that is uh, targeted to uh, uh, promote and foster and prepare for civilian development uh, uh, towards uh, space. And so we have actually uh, with us uh, uh, the founder. Uh, is also serving as, a, so that's Adriano Autino. Bravo, <laughs> and he's uh, now everybody. serving 
as a vice president and also as our ambassador and also is uh, is uh, also coordinating the Space Renaissance Academy. Yeah. And so very active and yeah. also he is our much. <laughs> he is also our Space Renaissance TV master. Uh, thanks to him, uh, we are broadcasting uh, worldwide uh, the event today. So thank you, Adriano. Thank you. And so uh, we have uh, also we want really to uh, appreciate and our host and um, and um, uh, so we have some partners uh, into the organization of this uh, event. So also we have the the International Lunar Expression Working Group that report to the COSPAR Committee to, for Space uh, Research. We have also the um, IEF, International Astronautical Federation, in particular, the ITACUS Committee for Cultural Utilization of Space, which uh, I have honor to share. And uh, actually, uh, uh, Sabine Hans, our local host that uh, will follow me in uh, uh, presenting and uh, introducing the festival. Uh, Adriano, our members of this, uh, we have, uh, uh, okay, a number of, uh, Okay, quite uh, uh, interesting colleagues that are joining us for this uh, uh, Space Renaissance uh, International Art and Science uh, uh, Festival. Uh, we have also some good collection uh, worldwide with a number of organizations. Uh, so I want to mention also uh, Galix, an organization promoting also space development, in particular over the Pacific. And uh, so we are planning to have a follow-up event uh, in Hawaii. Uh, so they have to uh, have a very good standard <laughs> after the, the high level of preparation that we can uh, see here. We have uh, also a number of uh, uh, technical uh, uh, committees and uh, humanistic committees that you will hear about uh, what they are doing. But uh, uh, with uh, no further ado, I would like then to invite and thank first uh, our local host, uh, the chair of the local uh, organizing committee, uh, Sabine Heinz. Uh, so she is uh, vice president of Space Renaissance International, but she's also leading the German chapter uh, of uh, Space Renaissance. And she's an achieved uh, artist and also space artist. And she has been very active uh, also now to okay, organize on all aspects, like all art artists do. Uh, they do the thinking, but they do also the end work and all the, the logistics. So thanks so much. Uh, uh, Sabine. Let's get a big round of applause to Sabine and all the helpers. And I pass you the door. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Bernard, for this nice introduction. Uh, actually, both ha uh, have said uh, what I wanted to say. Um, I very warmly would like to welcome you to our Space Renaissance Art and Science Festival. And I'm so proud that we can do it in this historical place. And uh, I would like to thank you to our, our, our sponsors, uh, Planetarium Berlin Foundation, to provide us this beautiful place. And um, I would like to thank you really much to thank you, the Support Association uh, of the Astronaut Observatory and the Science Grand Planetarium Berlin. Um, all the people running around here speaking in uh, German, in English, uh, are from this uh, association and they helped me a lot, really a lot, nights and days. Uh, and uh, the president of this association, Dr. Jürgen Rose, is sitting here. Thank you. Thank you so much for all this help. Um, I, I have to look in this camera. OK. And uh, I also would like to thank you all the other volunteers uh, Bernard sent me, but also from the observatory. Uh, my friends are helping me. And uh, this is really very, very nice. Um, the Aschenhold Observatory was founded in, in, 19, uh, 18, in 1896, I did this error uh, once, um, by Friedrich Simon Aschenhold. And uh, Dr. Lüning will talk uh, in this days a little bit more about the history of this place. And um, I also would like uh, to memorize uh, one of the directors of this observatory and the founding director of the Science Grand Planetarium Berlin, uh, Professor Dieter B. Hermann. Uh, he was uh, 
member of owner uh, of both associations of the Space Renaissance International and the Support Association from the Astronaut Observatory. And uh, he was 28 years uh, the director of this house. And uh, when the wall came down, uh, he did everything possible to save this houses because when the wall came down, we had the fact that we had several open, uh, opera houses, we had several planetariums and um, the new um, bosses or what can I, how can I say it? Um, yeah, it said um, also new government. Yeah, now we have everything double. We have to think uh, which one we can cancel. And they were, were thinking of canceling first these houses but it is the oldest uh, one. And we have the attraction that we have uh, uh, the longest lens telescope on earth here uh, with 21 meter. And uh, on uh, tomorrow in the night, I hope the weather will be nice. Uh, we will have an observation. And we have here also other uh, optical instruments and uh, solar physical cabinet and uh, other instruments. And uh, when the authorities came to the Zeiss Grand Planetarium in Prenzlauer Berg, uh, and to now it, it was a very huge planetarium, and it was the most modern planetarium in Europe, uh, the guy entered, looked at the building and said, hmm, to push it down uh, will not be very cheap. So this was uh, how they treated us. And uh, he just said, no. Um, you have to uh, push down first the other one because it's the most modern in Europe, so you cannot break it down. Um, yeah, and T uh, opens us many doors uh, for this festival, and uh, therefore I would like to thank you to him and to all other volunteers uh, which helped us. And now um, I wish us a really successful festival. We will have uh, very interesting lectures about art and science. We will uh, build a bridge between uh, both. Um, and uh, I think um, you will, you can look forward to a really, really nice and interesting program. So I wish us all a nice time. I would like to introduce our next speaker. It's uh, Professor Bernard Freund, he's our president. And he will talk about a program to boost the civilian space development. Thank you. When I the stage, it's yours. Okay, thank you, Sabina. Okay, so back uh, now uh, to present you also some uh, context and vision towards uh, the topic of uh, uh, civilian uh, development for space and uh, for this uh, I'm drawing of some experience that I've acquired actually uh, with colleagues by working uh, okay 30 years at the European Space Agency developing uh, missions uh, a mission our first mission of the millennium to go to the moon smart one but also working on a mission to Mars international space station uh, various also astronomy missions or solar and uh, stellar uh, missions, but as well uh, on the work uh, with my colleagues from the COSPAR Committee for Space Research, where I have now the honor to be vice chair, actually acting chair of the Planetary Commission and uh, a space exploration panel. And uh, we have also, so uh, as I mentioned, the ITACUS Committee for Cultural Education of Space of IF, uh, where we uh, are trying to promote uh, uh, also humanities, art, uh, societal uh, aspect uh, into space. Um, we will uh, see that uh, uh, as my affiliation, I have been put at Space Renaissance International, but also X Moon Mars. So what is X? X is a variable that can be Euro, Euro Moon Mars, that can be art, art Moon Mars. We have also created a, a new uh, uh, initiative called Moon Mars, which is also linking between uh, artists and uh, space. Uh, so we uh, uh, we have uh, okay various endeavor, and we are also now working uh, on expanding what is your activities 
which we started with your moon Mars for see a research program into your moon Mars Earth space innovation. So also to include the Earth in our goal and innovation business. And actually, I, I have the pleasure to announce that we just started actually yesterday in Barcelona, a new uh, contract with the European Commission, which is dedicated to, uh, uh, to a group that we have formed, which is called the uh, Euro Space Hub, and that wants to create space entrepreneur. And uh, we just had a kickoff yesterday in Barcelona, I just came <laughs> late last night, and uh, they are uh, supporting actually our Yomun Mars Earth Space Innovation Initiative, and also they will uh, support some of the activities uh, uh, towards young professionals in space renaissance at international. And so that's uh, what I, I do now. Okay, now let's talk about space renaissance and national. So our vision is uh, that uh, the, uh, the space uh, civilian development um, is, uh, um, we take into account economical, social, environmental uh, uh, vision, and it has to be glorious, positive, and uh, full of uh, hope and inspiration, in particular in this context where sometimes you may lose hope and you uh, think that there are quite uh, on Earth uh, some, uh, okay, conflict, disastrous situation, but we want uh, to uh, also develop uh, space to um, support uh, some of the sustainable development uh, goals on Earth. So uh, next slide is, uh, okay, we, I started actually some, 25 years ago, and actually I wanted to remember that I organized my first moon symposium in Europe, here in Germany, very close to this place. It was in the Hotel Estrel Berlin, maybe you know? So it was just being built, and I was uh, leading a study for a moon mission. That's where I organized my first moon meeting. So we are closing the loop. And uh, after this time, so I was in charge of our first moon mission, Smart One, and then I was called to contribute to this uh, International Lunar Exploration Working Group, of course, PAR, that put a vision towards the exploration of the moon with a phased approach. The first uh, uh, phase was to develop a fleet of uh, uh, orbiters that would make some reconnaissance, would explore the moon, and this were done. And then some precursor landers, and then have a robotic village with a coordinated uh, uh, number of uh, landers, rovers, that would uh, do science exploration, but also that would start to deploy larger infrastructures, even for humans, like habitat, food production, energy production. And then having a human outpost uh, that uh, where humans can uh, come for shorter duration, so typically two weeks, um, which is the duration of the, the daytime on the moon, and then something with a permanent sustainable human and robotic presence. So that's what we call the moon village. And uh, now, uh, okay, we are quite advanced in this uh, path. Now, next slide. Okay, where did we start? Okay, this is my baby, a smart one that we launched in 2003. So the first lunar mission of the millennium was European, but this was 20 years ago. So we have not launched another one since. But uh, we uh, provided some new data about the moon, about the moon uh, history, about the moon uh, craters, even the polar region. And at the end, we had an uh, end of mission with an impact on the surface of the moon that we could observe uh, from the Earth. And so the moon we use uh, as a place where you study processes that help uh, to understand rocky planets like the Earth. So next slide shows that uh, um, so that's some images of the impact of Smart One, like uh, we observed in real time, and uh, we share that with the whole world. After Smart One, we um, were actually, thanks to Smart One, we were a focus of attention in Europe with all countries that were preparing lunar missions. And for instance, uh, we um, uh, started collaboration with, uh, with uh, Japan that prepared a bigger mission, Kaguya, that uh, they launched in 2007, uh, with a number of spacecraft actually, and they unveiled the really new uh, data about the gravity field of the moon, in particular from the far side, which was uh, unknown in terms of gravity. And we had also um, a good collaboration with China, 
that actually even use Mark One when we were around the moon to validate their ground telescope. And then they launched in 2007 their first mission, Chang'e 1, and then another one, Chang'e 2 in 2010, then they had a lander, Chang'e 3 in uh, 2017. Since they launched Chang'e 1, they have launched seven spacecraft to the moon. So China really has been accelerating uh, and uh, they have invited Europe to contribute some, uh, uh, some exchange of data. And also I was uh, at that time um, um, leading the negotiation and the agreement that we had with the Indian Space Research Organization, ISRO that uh, bid, uh, launched a mission in 2008 and a mission which where they had six instruments international and where they have really confirmed the presence of water on the moon. After this, we had a number of uh, American mission Gray, uh, LADI, Lunar Consensus Orbiter, a big L cross in Pakistan. So really all robotic uh, fleet of uh, orbiter and landers, and clearly we have started the robotic image. So our next pass is toward a sustainable presence on the moon. And for this, this is, uh, okay, we have a vision, uh, we call it moon village uh, vision, which is also a phase approach, but we use some advanced uh, technology of, uh, you know, industry 4.0 or space 4.0, new space, where we are going to launch uh, some modules and then we will uh, use uh, some of the regolith to protect some inflatable structures. We use rovers, we use 3D printing, and, uh, and then we will have uh, some more sustainable way to build a uh, moon habitat and uh, uh, expand a moon village. Now, um, there is also a vision to go um, from what we have invested in low Earth orbit, as you know, we have now two international space station in orbit. There is an international space station uh, uh, with, uh, with the US, Europe, uh, uh, Russia, and Canada, and uh, with uh, more than uh, okay, 20 countries uh, involved, uh, through ESA in particular. And so uh, this is uh, now active for 22 years. But we have also a new international space station, which is a Chinese uh, station, uh, that is Tiangong, uh, uh, and that is uh, now we just add a crew going uh, toward a, a six months expedition. And from this time, after two previous st uh, stations, Tiangong 1 and Tiangong 2, we, they will stay six months and they will be replaced by other astronauts, also leading to a permanent uh, uh, presence uh, there. So it's quite uh, amazing that historically, in the last 22 years, we had always a human in space. So humanity is not only restricted to our planet, we are already uh, partly in space. And uh, uh, some of these uh, astronauts, okay, they, they went through a very uh, selective process uh, to, to be trained, but our vision that this is going to expand and uh, we'll have more opportunities for civilians uh, to be involved into space and then go to the moon and even other decisions in the solar system. Now in governmental programs, so there is a full program going from what we have done in the International Space Station or lower Earth Orbit. We'll have more uh, commercial stations in lower Earth Orbit, which will have also vocation to receive uh, civilians. And then also there will be uh, uh, some orbiting stations around the moon and opportunities even for civilians to go around the moon. And on the surface of the moon, we'll have also opportunities, our governmental uh, program, like the Artemis program, where which is targeting uh, um, some two astronauts in 2025, but uh, we have also a very strong commercial initiative, like uh, uh, SpaceX is building a starship that could bring 100 people to the surface of the moon at once. And then from that, with uh, the preparation also that we do with robotic mission to explore uh, the science and the environment of Mars, we see also opportunities to have humanities going to, to Mars and to settle there for the benefit of uh, all uh, humankind, but even uh, all Earth. So that's a global exploration roadmap. So the next slide shows in detail what is planned uh, for the moon. So with the series, the next slide. Uh, so see, we have a well-defined uh, mission which are approved, uh, some precursors from uh, various uh, countries. And uh, of course, a big effort now is in um, Artemis uh, uh, 1 uh, from the um, uh, Artemis program, which is led by the US, 
and uh, we will hear some news about Emis One, where some of our uh, big experts, rocket expert, uh, uh, rocket is uh, with us and is following very accurately what is the latest stage of the testing and the preparation. Uh, and uh, we are looking at uh, maybe a first uh, uh, window uh, for launch. Uh, that could be um, at the end of August. Uh, uh, so that could be an opportunity, or we will see, depending on the status of test and preparation, if there will be also another window in September, October. But we, this is a very important uh, milestone. So this is a, with a SLS expensive uh, rocket, but okay, it has been uh, built. So let's see what it does. And in parallel, there are also opportunities with some commercial uh, rockets. So really, that's, this year is a year of truth for the, for the program. And uh, after that, there will be an Artemis launch every year uh, with uh, various uh, uh, objectives, uh, bringing various assets in orbit and also various assets on the surface. With the first woman on the moon in 2025, and first uh, man of color as well in 2025, but in parallel, we have to look at uh, commercial endeavors and also uh, endeavors for other <laughs> groups. <coughs> Next slide. <coughs> so indeed, there are challenges for impression of the moon village. So if you click uh, multiply, you can see we have to, to go there. Oh, that's a, Yes, oh, I can do it also. Yeah, yeah, you have to get there. So that's uh, the rocket side. Next one, we have to operate, to communicate, survive. Mobility is a key. Human and robotic partnership. Also, um, it's important to use resources that you have there. So you have much more resources there than in free space. And the new challenge now is that we are not going to do it only with government money. So we want to involve users that are going to spend maybe 80% of the budget. So that's where Space Renaissance International come, because we have a vision to, to uh, OK, it's based on the philosophy, on thinking, and, um, and uh, all over the world. And so we, we are uh, trying to promote, thank you, pr promote the civilian development of uh, space. So we have the founder here with us, Adriano, and he was uh, also president for many years until 2021, which is a time when we organized a large space renaissance congress. And at the end, we uh, uh, had a number of uh, action plan recommendations for five years, and also uh, was uh, honored to be elected president. And we had also uh, a number of um, other presidents. So our mission, we want to, no, I, I can do it. Uh, uh, we can promote the expansion of civilization into space. And we want to involve uh, space companies, individual institutions, space agencies. And uh, we look at all this uh, um, link with economy, culture, and, and so on. And we have also a special program for education outreach. So we had a various uh, milestone in the build up of our community. So we had the World Congresses in 2011, 2016, 2021, so national congresses. And uh, we start to, to build also a good number of uh, community and, uh, and followers. Now, services that we want to bring to the community is networking, business, advocacy, and uh, social analysis of uh, where we are in our situation and how expansion into space can also uh, allow to to serve some of our sustainable goals for society and education and outreach. So we had our big uh, congress uh, that was uh, in uh, okay, 2021. We had a number of uh, top level uh, speakers and so that uh, participated. And what is important is uh, the set of uh, action recommendations that uh, we are now trying to follow for the next five years. So one is going forward to the moon. Another space debris uh, recovery and reuse. Enhance life protection in space. Experimenting with simulated gravity. Also develop program with young generation. Uh, developing 100% reusable space. Produce food in space. Uh, space safety and protection. Uh, even uh, support space tourism industries. 
a study option for space-based uh, solar power. And we have also created a new uh, branch of activities, support space-related art. And uh, we have a Sabina that is sharing an art chapter on this. And also a vision that uh, uh, now our society needs to go beyond the 17 sustainable development goal by adding an 18th one, which is to bootstrap the civilian space and it's going to benefit the whole society. So that's, uh, in short, our uh, vision. Okay. Okay. Oh, sorry. No, sorry. Yeah. Next one. Yeah. yeah. And so, okay, uh, we know also after we have done all this work, uh, okay, we have uh, the final event party, and as, like we have here, that uh, in a good tradition. Next slide. Uh, so, uh, can I? Yeah. So we are organized uh, with a, a board of uh, directors and a vice president. Uh, so you can see their face and uh, you can get uh, familiar with that. This information is available on the website and coming from uh, all uh, uh, continents. And we have uh, developed also a Space Renaissance Academy with a Space Philosophy uh, Laboratory with a number of uh, activities uh, uh, there. Uh, we have also a Space Development Laboratory with a number of committees that are in particular following some of these uh, 10 action uh, a uh, plan that uh, I have mentioned before. And uh, we have, of course, uh, uh, some also activities like running a webinar every two weeks that is organized uh, by Sabina. Uh, we have also some uh, funding, uh, Medici uh, funds that we use for supporting uh, uh, young professionals. So uh, this is uh, available on our website if you want information. So <clears throat> this is also put in link with another academy that we have started uh, uh, with the Moon Mars, where we developed a program for universities to train astronauts and space entrepreneurs. We, and for this, we just got re received a new grant. So I want to advertise uh, that, something where we do uh, physical training, scientific and technical, also humanities training, as well as management training. And so this we will cover later. And uh, so, um, Let's uh, go forward for Space Renaissance Art and Science Festival 2022. Thank you very much for your attention. Okay. Thank you for your lecture. Wow, okay, that's a beautiful blue uh, book. Yes. Blick in das Weltall, die Geschichte der Archenhold Sternwarte. So that's, uh, uh, okay, a look into the universe and the history of this place. Well, I'm very honored. Thank you very much. And uh, clearly we want, uh, of course, to remember Professor Dieter Hermann uh, for what he has done for astronomy, popularization, and for this place. Thank you very much. Yeah, um, Adriano. Yeah. It's your turn. Okay. So, okay. So the, the speaker uh, introduced the next speaker. <laughs> and so the, yes. And so the next uh, speaker is um, Adriano Tino. Uh, so the founder of Space Renaissance International and the vice president of SRI. And his topic is uh, uh, a feasible utopia for the 21st century. Okay, so you do it from... Uh, no, I will speak from here. And oh. uh, okay, let, let me change the, the camera. Just a moment. Okay. <coughs> Okay. Uh, share my screen. Hello. Yeah. Now this is the the wrong one. Okay. This is. Okay, uh, so the uh, physical utopia for the 20, 21st century, uh, in my opinion, uh, should start now. We don't have to wait for 21st century, for, for sure. Uh, so my talking about utopias is usually associated to talking about the future. 
but in these days, such association is controversial. Utopian science fiction promised a beautiful future to come in some centuries, at least. Dystopian science fiction warned about hopeful futures due to human presumption to make things better than natural. Such awful future seems to be our present now. Do we really need more visions of a wonderful future? Would not be that just another illusion even more dangerous because it could keep us quietly dreaming while the civilization is imploding. More than a vision for the future, we need a vision for the present to fight the multiple crises towards evolution and not regression. So, first of all, we have to think about why the terrestrial utopias failed so far. Uh, ending to be worse than the social model they aimed to improve or replace, many utopias resulted to be procrustes pets. Trying to simplify the society by suppressing most of the individual aims, feelings, and hopes. Trying to reduce the great human cultural variety to a single thought. Such utopias, when applied to real society, gave a substantial ideological base to coercive, illiberal, and authoritarian regimes. All utopias so far were aimed to establish a claimed fair management of scarce resources. In a context of scarce resources, natural egoism leads to new bureaucratic and despotic governance. When environments with the relatively abundant resources were found, like the new world of America, such territories had to be contended with native peoples, almost exterminated. Any utopia being limited to terrestrial boundaries and resources failed so far. Do we really need a new utopia? So what is the Procrustes bed? Procrustes was a rogue bandit from Attica. He attacked people by stretching them or cutting off their legs so as to force them to fit the size of an iron bed. So he uh, cut the legs of the two long people and tried to prolong the arts of, of the small uh, ones. So, but we have many different human types. Stephen Wolf, an evolution philo evolutionist philosopher, uh, a good friend of, of uh, spatial essence, identified different types of attitudes in humans. The wanderer, or the explorer, the settler, the inventor, the designer, the builder, the protector, the visionary, the philosopher, the holder. So each one of us maybe has one or more of these characteristics in their psychology, in their character. And Howard Gardner, from his point of view, identified several types of different intelligence, human intelligence, linguistic, mathematical, logical, musical, visual, spatial, bodily, kinesthetic, interpersonal, intrapersonal, naturalistic, existential. So, if we put on a matrix, on a d-dimensional matrix, the, the Wolf characteristics and the Gardner characteristics, we get an enormous uh, number of combinations. That means really many, many different uh, billions of people. And if we add the geographical axis to this matrix, get into a three-dimensional matrix, uh, we reach a, a really a very, very big uh, number of different uh, human beings. That means that really, when we say that each one of our 8 billion people on Earth is an individual uh, with his or her own characteristic, this is the truth and it is scientific. It is not just an, 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 an idea. So, utopias are dangerous, yet necessary. What, are, what is the risk of utopias? To take all of this variety and try to reduce to one only thought, one only uh, consensus, one only thing to be done for everybody. Different human types are billions. To assure freedom and a future to all of them requires a great vision, vast space and abundant resources. Human creativity is stimulated by few main forces, concurrent and synergistic. Natural, individual egoism aimed to conquer wealth and a high lifestyle. 
ideologies, big projects, and great visions, encouraging people to undertake entrepreneurial, entrepreneurial initiatives. Think about the example given by Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos. The generous aim to improve civilization. It is the spirit shared by many researchers in any field, science, humanistics, arts, philosophy. Applying a new heuristic to the history of utopias, such a system based on utopias were fragile systems, since they were based on 100% consensus, but very less than 100% inclusivity. More than a new utopia, rather we need an anti-utopia, not a dystopia, not yet another nihilist ideology. It will not suggest any particular governance or social model, opposite it will promise full freedom for each community to come to organize their society according to their agreed models, aims, and projects. Our anti-utopia will just promote the achievement of a platform of very abundant resources suitable for 100% inclusive civilization for many trillions people for millennia to come. So what would be a new feasible anti-utopia? Some key requirements to design a valid utopia endowed with solid anti-fragile characteristics. Growth is the main requirement, since any climate stimulus civilization will quickly decay and collapse. 100% sustainability is the logical second requirement for any present vision of development. 100% inclusivity, that doesn't mean any kind of automated welfare for everybody. Yet to assure the platform of resources necessary to allow each individuals and communities to get well if so they wish. Thanks to their own ingenuity, fantasy, decision, capabilities, and initiative. Tailored for the present, a 2,100 vision should not in any way suggest that we can risk for better life in the future. Our descendants' lifestyle in that century depends upon our decision and was now, before 2030. We have to start working now without waiting anymore for brilliant futures, referring to classic science fiction. So, yet, who are the true utopians? It's not us, it is United Nations. In fact, if we look at the 70 Sustainable Development Goals, we see that they say no poverty, zero hunger, good health and well being, quality education, gender equality clean water and sanitation, affordable and clean energy, decent work and economic growth, industry, innovation and infrastructure, reduced inequalities, sustainable cities and communities, responsible consumption and production, climate action, life below water, life on land, peace, justice and strong institutions, partnership for the goals. It was not a waste of time to read all of the 17 goals because they are often considered altogether uh, without going deep inside. And, but what they are, they are a utopia, considering the situation of the world now. The climate, the wars, the, uh, the economy, the migration. So all of these are utopian goals. This is what they are. But uh, uh, what I try to do is to understand which are the pillars of this. And if, in fact, we have three goals that can be considered the pillars sustaining the rest of the goals. And these are affordable and clean energy, decent work and economic growth, industry, innovation, and infrastructure. If we don't have these three conditions, all the rest will remain in Utopia, unfeasible. So, what we should do is to put uh, the, the correct architecture of the sustainable goals. In the, uh, at the bottom, we have the pillars, energy, economic work uh, and growth, industry innovation. On the second stage, we have the human life goals, no poverty, zero hunger, etc. At the third stage, we have the planet Earth environment and goals, and at the last and upper stage, I put the methodology goals that are responsible consumption and partnership for the goals. So, but the question is, is all of this sustainable? This is the question. 
The reality is that all of these goals will be sustainable only if we have an 18 goal that will be the real pillar of everything, that is civilian space development, to expand our industry in the geolunar space and beyond, to get to abundant resources, to relieve planet Earth environment from the burden of our industrial development, to half the demand of energy on Earth, because if we move industries in the space, the, the, the demand energy of the industry will be in space, directly from the sun. And on Earth, we will have only the demand from the cities. Think about that. Demand, the, the energy demand is growing. Anyway, inter, the internet society requires more energy and so on. The electric car requires more energy and so on. So the key word is sustainability. The sustainability of the seven, eight, and nine SDGs is the real challenge. The only sustainable development for a billion people is beyond the limit of this planet. Energy demand by internet society, okay, I will say that. Expansion is indispensable, not to grab space resources to keep Earth in society, yet to give the Earthers the freedom to set them in the solar system. A transterrestrial society shall begin to exist. The space diaspora brings many benefits. First of all, survival of civilization. So, when we think about Earth, we think about Mother Earth. But I think that maybe you should, uh, uh, you should uh, uh, represent Earth like a fat guy, a fat man, that is a bulimic guy. Abandoning his weights all around himself, spade the breeze, needing a living treatment more than to swallow more food from lunar and asteroid raw materials. Space resources should be used in space to develop space infrastructures, habitats, and industrial settlements. So, are you missing Mother Earth? Yes, I am. Here is Mother Earth. And uh, the children of Earth are ready for their primary school, what Kate and Kraft Eric called Development Stage 1 of the Moon. When children grow up, they start moving out of home, and the mother get young again. Can draw the mother can mother Earth can draw her breath. Some benefits of civilian space development. Extremely urgent is to kick off the civilian space development. We can have overcoming the global crisis towards an unprecedented economic and cultural development. Protection of planet Earth's environment by moving industrial development outside, mitigation of the global risk of extinction, mitigation of climate and meteorological phenomena, escape the pincer of, pincer of consumerism, high educational value, and unsculptured and social ethics, Earth is not sick, she's pregnant, and more peace, the most important, thanks to the progressive obsolescence of the war for resources. So, the only perspective that can give back hope in the future to humans is a new great horizon of development, expanding civilization into the solar system. Any advancement, however slight in any branch of human activity, is covered by two powerful and unstoppable motivation. The intention to improve the individual chances of survival, the lowest, level, lowest levels of Maslow scale of needs, the desire to help improve the conditions of existence and pursuit of happiness and communities, and especially at the world, highest levels of moral scale. Ultimately, the mixture of selfishness, compassion, and protagonism, which characterizes for better or worse our species and defines us as human beings. So, uh, the 21st century, a development stage one of the space utopia. The richness of human patrimony in our culture, the biodiversity, diversity with the safeguard of Wolf, Gardner, and Maslow. Nature will be allowed again to do its preferred job, grow the differentiation evolution. Our utopia technically will be a non utopia or an anti utopia that's different from a dystopia, or better, an a utopia, a feasible happy place, from the Greek term a utopia. 
Never realizing again any progressive there. Unlike the American frontier, there are no indigenous peoples on the state frontier, no need to fight. So they're going to the end. I want to recall the Maslow hierarchic needs and the topics. Uh, from the basic ones that are the biological, the safety, love and belongingness, esteem and reputation, to the growth needs, cognitive, aesthetic, cultural self actualization, transcendence. And we can note that the classist utopias only insisted on the lowest levels of the Marlowe scale, while a humanist utopia for today, space expansionist utopia, will consider all. These, uh, the, the needs. Why? Because we are, we can have the platform, the, the, the material platform to, to realize that. So, from each one according to their creativity and availability, to each one according to their desires and capacity of imagination. For man does not lie by breath alone. The superfluous is indispensable. Okay, so I can go. Ahead, just giving a flash of what could be uh, at, at development stage one of a civilian space development. It involves synoptic prospecting of geolunar space, cis Martian space, asteroid belt, detect metallogenic or mineralogenic provinces, and to obtain other advanced information for industrial site selection. Emphasis on oxygen, water, basic life supporting elements, raw materials suitable to produce. Produce fuel, raw materials, built infrastructures, construction, and orbital debris, establishing fuel station in Earth orbit, lunar orbit, and moon Lagrange points, developing space energy plants, building advanced space stations, evolving the space law. So, of course, these, the S1 and the S2, are methodologically derived from craft area, lunar and sterilization. And settlement work of polyglobal civilization written in 1985. Uh, that I, I, I will will be the argument of my next uh, speech uh, tomorrow. Uh, and the DS2, the development stage two, industrial settlement kickoff, relocate, relocate a meaningful initial part of terrestrial TV industry in the geological space, allowing so to start decreasing the global energy demand, demand on Earth. The uh, conference will be a preparation phase for the third generation space community, construction of large orbital habitats with artificial gravity to host many thousands of citizens, development of large industrial segment, processing lunar and asteroid mean and mine materials, development of advanced spaceport transportation system for people and cargo using different propulsion technologies, uh, solar saving, non thermal propulsion, electric propulsion. And development of space market, space to space supply, space industry to feed space industry in first habitats, space to earth supply, space industry to feed the early consumers market. According, I, I, I want just to say something about this last point space to earth supply. The history of the frontiers, including the American frontier, say that. Selling the products uh, to the old world is possible only when the infrastructure of the new world is established. So this thing to, to feed the earth market can start uh, uh, in, only in, a, in an advanced state, in a state, state development state too of the industry sector. Last, I want to mention uh, His Holiness Dalai Lama who say that our life is something that is based on hope. If we don't have hope, our life is a nightmare. The hope is the really important thing. So what does it mean that we don't think that starting, kicking off civilian state development now will solve immediately all of our problems. The problem will remain, it will be hard to be uh, resolve it. Uh, but the difference is that we will have the hope, we will have projects to motivate the young people. And this is important to avoid uh, collapsing the civilization and to keep on uh, evolving.
and progress. Okay, that's all. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Excellent, Adriano, so the right on time. I think we will keep questions maybe for after the, the different speakers, but in the meantime, I want on behalf of uh, Sabine and the observatory to give you, Adriano, this uh, special memento uh, uh, celebrating Professor Herman. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Sabine. This is a wonderful gift for me. Uh, breaking the spell power, okay. Is a, a book by Professor Dieter Emmert, who sadly passed away a few months ago. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Good, excellent. So the next uh, speaker now is Professor Michael Waltermatte uh, from Bochum. Uh, that I, I had the pleasure to have a number of programs together, and he even came with his cohort of uh, students uh, to ESTAC, and he's going to talk uh, about Will there be Sundays on Mars? So, uh, of course, uh, Observer Timata is uh, an expert uh, in uh, space uh, theology, and uh, we, we have heard also him at a number of events. But uh, let's see what he has to say about Mars Sundays. Thank uh, you very so much. Did you load it already? No, I haven't. Can we? Okay, that's, okay. Uh, that's great. Thank you so much. How do we want to do that? Do yeah. I use that microphone? Yeah, uh, you can uh, use. Uh, uh, we can use this camera, and uh, we can yes, use yes, this we are on that camera, but this. Uh, okay, I have to... Uh, he can speak also without slides, so he will. Uh, yeah, he will exactly. Start. I can. I can just. I can just stop talking. And um, okay, so uh, thank you for the opportunity. I'm a theologian from the Euro University in Bochum here in Germany, and um, I've I've just had some 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 interesting thoughts during Adriano's talk, and I think I will touch on some of those. So the title of my talk is "Will There Be Sunday on Mars?" which um, I actually won't be talking about. Um, but maybe in the end, in the questions, we can relate to that. Let me let me start by by going into the history of space exploration and religion. When on Christmas Eve, 1968, and that is going to be the second slide, um, Apollo 8 flew around the surface, uh, around the around the moon in the orbit of the moon. The Apollo astronauts did something at that time. In their mind, not so controversial, but in what happened afterwards, very controversial. They read from the Bible. They read from biblical scripture. And um, can I use this thing? Does that work? No, just no, no, no. Just, um, just a moment. I have to adjust. Yeah, no problem. So they, they read from scripture, right? They read from the first chapter of the Bible. Um, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth, earth was void and without form, and so on and so forth. And at the end of the reading, they even had the audacity to bless the population of Earth. Now, what that there's there's two things that happened there. Um, the next day, the president of the American Atheist Association, Madeleine Murray O'Hare, sued the U.S. government for spending tax dollars on sending religious messages from outer space. And the funny thing about that is that went all the way to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court tossed it out using the argument that the Supreme Court of the United States of America is has no jurisdiction over lunar orbit. So NASA got off with a with a slap there. Um, and the, the interesting bit about that is if you go back to the history of religion and space exploration, having no jurisdiction in lunar orbit could actually be an interesting argument when it comes to what the Obama administration did in regards to being able to um, mine resources in outer space. Who gives whom jurisdiction over those resources if the US Supreme Court had no jurisdiction for religious messages in outer space? I'm, I'm just saying that because I think it could be an interesting argument in the in the past. Yeah, just just barge I can in. do it yourself. I can do it myself. That's great. Okay. So what, what happened then? And I'm just go, show, going very briefly through the history of space and, and Christianity. So reading from the Bible, that was actually a Jewish Christian thing that happened. Then when Apollo 11 landed on the moon, they celebrated the first thing they did they celebrated Holy Communion on the moon after they had made sure that they would survive the landing and be able to lift off again. And they did not advertise that on the radio, right? Because they had been sued before. Um, so Christianity played a big part in 
American space exploration, at least. I'm not going to talk about lunar Bibles. If you want to know, learn about that, talk to me later. Um, hang on, this is the right switch. Nowadays, still rockets are being blessed by, by priests, especially in Russia, Orthodox priests. There is um, Christmas celebrated on the International Space Station. And if you look at the, um, at the upper part of that, uh, that picture, there's even a crucifix up there and some religious icons. So there is religious spaces in outer space um, when humans go there. This is actually a picture that is six years older. Nowadays, Christmas is no longer celebrated in this religious sense, but with the... Um, with the universal symbol of the stocking and the Christmas tree. So as religion is transforming on the surface of earth, it also seems to be transforming in outer space. What is, what is true for Christianity is also true for other religions. As an example, Judaism, when the first Israeli astronaut, Ilan Ramon, flew on the, on the ill-fated Columbia mission that then burned up during re-entry, he asked um, two Jewish scholars, two Jewish rabbis, before he went, how he could live Judaism in outer space. And uh, that was, for instance, interesting in regard to how do you keep the Sabbath in outer space? Just very briefly, Sabbath from dawn, dawn, dusk, dusk on Friday evening. So when the first stars, um, when, the, when the sun sets on Friday evening to when the first stars appear in the night sky on Saturday, it's 24 hours usually. In Earth orbit, that's 90 minutes. So how do you do that in Earth orbit? Do you stop working every six times 90 minutes? Or is there another rule? And the obvious rule for that was um, you adhere to the 24-hour rotation of the Earth because God created it that way. And who are you to change that rule? Similar thing for... That doesn't, oh yeah. Um, for, for Islam, here the pressing question that got in the news was... In which direction do you pray if you're a Muslim in outer space, right? If you're a Muslim on the surface of Earth, and if you are in Mecca, you pray to the, toward the Kaaba. If you are outside of Mecca, you pray in the, uh, the geogra in the direction of the geographic projection of Mecca. But what do you do when you're in outer space, right? You can imagine orbiting the Earth 90 minutes per rotation. This astronaut, the, the Muslim astronaut from Malaysia, being asked that question said, allow one's adoration, not acrobatics. And the rule is similar to what Judaism said. You just adhere to the same rule that has been within Islamic tradition for centuries. Um, you pray to Allah with having it in your heart to pray only to that God and not to some other God. So there's solutions within religious tradition to uphold said religious tradition once you go to outer space and plan to return to planet Earth. But what if you just go to outer space? What happens with religion if it comes from outer space even? This is, this is an, um, a memorial for the astronauts that died during the so-called space race that is on the surface of the moon. Interesting story about... Those are, oh boy, I'm sorry about that. Um, interesting story about this, this, uh, this little astronaut figure there. The artist was supposed to stay anonymous as not to benefit from space exploration. After a couple of years, the artist revealed himself and that got the astronauts who put that up on the moon into trouble. So there's, there's this weird connection between having religious icons, having places of memorial in space and all this jurisdiction thing that comes with it. This, the next image is a soccer ball. That is the last survivor of the Challenger mission. So that, that soccer ball was supposed to fly onto into space on Challenger and it was put up in space 35 years after the disaster and uh, inflated up in space and is now floating out there or was not then floating out there as a memorial to the fallen astronauts. So another example of creating something that is religious or semi-religious in outer space. But there's more, there's something that already happened during Apollo 8. And that is called, Frank White coined that term, the overview effect. The effect when astronauts, or what happens to astronauts when they look at the earth from the outside. And that seems to not only change astronauts in a profound way, but also changed earth culture. 
Um, here's a quote of what the overview effect does to you. That's from Ed Mitchell, um, Apollo 14 astronaut. Uh, just read the, the, the last two sentences. From out there on the moon, international politics looks so petty because you look at the whole Earth as, as at the Earth as a whole. You want to grab a politician by the scruff of the neck, drag him a quarter of a million miles out and say, look at that you and I won't read that. So there's this, there's this notion that when you are out there, you get this brand new perspective on everything that changes yourself and your relation to humanity completely. Here's another example. You don't even have to go to the moon for that. You can experience that from Skylab, so from Earth orbit. Um, the result is that you enjoy the life that is before you. It allows you to have inner peace. And to show you that that is not only an American thing, suddenly cosmonaut Oleg Makarov, suddenly you get a feeling you've never had before. You are an inhabitant of the Earth. So the overview effect, sorry, um, relates humans in a very special way to their home planet and to the society that exists on said home planet. Um, but what about this? What about what Buzz Aldrin called magnificent desolation? The experience of being somewhere out there where there is no humanity. Um, and that is a stark contrast to looking at Earth at this you know, pale blue dot when you look at it from, from farther out or spaceship Earth when you look at it from up close. And that change now alluded to that. The overview effect changed society in that way. Stuart Brand called the overview effect the thing that turned him into this, this ecologically interested person. The overview effect is what basically jump-started the ecological movement. And that ecological movement then changed the way theologians like myself think of the relation between humans and what we call creation. Um, in current history, no, we're not so current. Once, once they, they put this module on the International Space Station, the cupola module, the astronauts spend a lot more time just looking down at Earth, right? Sitting in that module looking at the surface of the earth you can see that in the protocols of what kind of data is broadcast down from the international space station it's a lot more pictures and images of the earth once they had the opportunity to look at that so you can say the overview effect is a is a good example of how humanity is connected to its home planet and how humanity changes its perspective of the own planet, start of the ecological movement and so on and so forth. And I've shown you examples of how this overview effect turned astronauts to humility and maybe looking at themselves as being part of all of humanity. Now, there are people who go out to space just for the overview effect. And I'll show you two ex historical examples because we don't have that much data on current space tourist tourists. That is Anoshe Ansari. And her version of the overview effect, the experience of the overview effect is this. The overview effect sort of reduces things to a size that you think everything is manageable. All these things that may seem big and impossible, impossible, right? we can do this. Peace on earth, no problem. The overview effect gives people that type of energy, that type of power, and I have experienced that. So from becoming a humble part of something bigger, the overview effect also turns people into the person who can solve all Earth's problems. From a theological point of view, that is very interesting. It's between hybris and humility at the same time. Um, another example for that would be Richard Garriott, but for, well, for, for lack of time, I won't go there. Um, let me just say that the overview effect seems to be one of the reasons, and you can see that with this cupola window installed on that spacecraft, but also on other spacecraft, the overview effect seems to be one of the reasons why people want to go to space. Jeff Bezos said he wanted to fill, fulfill his, his boyhood dream. So is that overview effect something that can help us overcome our problems when we are still tied to Earth or do we need to go outside of Earth? And as a theologian, there are, oops, sorry, I'm clicking the wrong direction here. No, I'm not. What happened? We just went, this thing needs an exorcism. Um, 
we just went in the wrong direction. Just jump through this briefly. Um, as a theologian, this is from an interesting example for me, and that could also serve as a very interesting example for what, what you've been talking about in the talk before. That is an artist's concept on the temple of the surface on the moon. It's on the rim of Shackleton Crater, and the characteristics of that temple are that you can only see the Earth for part of the time. So that is the one spot on the surface of the moon, or not the one spot, but one of the spots on the surface of the moon, where you have to face the fact that you cannot experience the overview effect all the time. So you lose your connection to Earth. And that may change humanity in a rather different way than what I've just showed you when they are able to experience the overview effect. This temple is also going to be at a place where there's... Um, a good deal of sunlight. So this is going to be one of the very contested spaces on earth, maybe a good place to put a church. Um, if we go further out there, expand into outer space, there will be several different problems. And how do we deal with places like that with magnificent desolation is I think one of the more interesting um, aspects, because when you look at something like an uninhabited, inhospitable place in the universe, and there are colleagues of mine who say we should not settle that because it is the way it is and it has value of its own. Then you need to ask the question, where does that value come from? Who assigns that value? Do we as humans assign that value and hinder ourselves from going there? Or is that a religious argument that basically says that is a virtue that was endowed on the moon by God, and it shouldn't be changed the way it is. And then you have this conflict between what do humans do in the larger universe? What are humans allowed to do in the larger universe? And what are the qualities of said universe having been given to it from the outside? So people who argue that you shouldn't settle the moon, in my perspective, might use religious arguments, oops, we're going somewhere else, might use religious arguments, although they don't want to. And the other interesting bit is what happens when this happens? What happens when the astronaut comes and you all see that the real catastrophe here is not what happens in the background, but that guy is never going to drink that beer. Um, so what happens if the earth no, is going no, to be... because when I do something... Uh, yeah, I should have just... yeah, I, I have What happened? Recall. All right, I, I just keep talking. Um, what happened if that catastrophe happens? Do we use that religion model? Do we use the ark to send all of Earth life into outer space? And if we do that, who do we send? We've just heard from Adriano that it might be a great idea to, to become a solar system civilization. You could well make an argument based on religious theological arguments that it might be a great idea to send other earth life and not go ourselves because we are really high maintenance creatures on this planet maybe send the low maintenance creatures and let something like evolution creation run its course somewhere else i don't know how i'm doing for time when you said five minutes i was almost out so these are the things i would i would like to 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 post to you the questions i would like to ask of you and we already have solutions for that oh you can just let me let me let me go to the end of this we already have solutions for that something like planetary protection rules and i'm the co-author of a paper <laughs> that basically asks the question if we have a rule for contaminating or sending our life to other celestial bodies in the solar system. And that rule is this rule, limit to 10 to the minus four, the probability of Earth life grabbing hold. Why is it that rule? What is the argument behind that? In this case, and we show that in the paper, it's a technical argument, but shouldn't there be an ethical argument? Why do we go there to one in 10,000 why don't we use the same probability as being admitted to RuPaul's drag race and colonize the solar system more with Earth life? Or why don't we go the probability of winning a six number lottery? And I think you don't need technical arguments to make that distinction. I think you need theological, philosophical and ethical arguments to make that. And you also need to have more people in the room when you discuss that than space scientists, um, politicians, lawyers and so forth. So I would, I would argue for ethical theological consideration of, for instance, those questions, who gets to go and under what probabilities. 
with that, I thank you for your time and yeah. for listening. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, uh, don't leave, don't leave, because uh, I want also, oh. on behalf of the Arsenal of Stalbart, to running. give you a <laughs> break in. Okay, okay, wonderful. Thank you, Bernard. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> So, coffee we have time for coffee break. Yeah. And uh, we'll we are continue at uh, 20 minutes. Yeah. <laughs> um, just one short information. Uh, we have to order the dinner. Uh, please, uh, who has not done it so far, uh, look at the menu because we have to order the menu. Um, yeah, but it's not for the yeah. <laughs> for the public. Um, yeah, uh, and the reception desk there is a list, and uh, please write <coughs> or choose your dinner. Thank you. Um, can you this also do? Can Sorry? you? You have to go to the reception desk and to choose the dinner you want to eat because I have to order the dinner you want to eat. The dinner. Yeah. Can you go to Uta and do it now? No. Yeah, because I have to order. You have to, to set your your uh, your station in the other room. Yeah, but it's one minute. It's one minute. Okay. You look at the menu let, let and. Let me do something. Else. No, 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 take it. Beautiful presentation.
from mechanisms oh, oh. Well, no, no, no. from uh, mechanisms okay. that were basically protected from UV light. And there's different kind of biochemical ways how to do that. So uh, you can have uh, chlorophyll, there's very different types of chlorophyll. There are also um, uh, carotenoids or bacterial rhodopsin. And the way to get bacterial rhodopsin to do that is very different than uh, with chlorophyll. Oh, and uh, this is actually a rock from the Atacama Desert that's a cyanobacteria, and I turned that one around, and it's on the underside because it's protected from UV radiation. It still gets enough light, and it's also moist, so it still can grow over there. Uh, let's look at endosymbiosis because endosymbiosis led to the invention of mitochondria, chloroplasts, and even the nucleus. So with that, we have the first eukaryotes. And this is an event that's still all the time occurring, even between animals and archaea. We don't know really uh, whether it evolved from parasitism or incomplete digestions, that uh, there's many ways that it can, can occur. So this is also a many past event. And actually, here is an example that is lichen, that is symbiosis between fungi and uh, algae, or cyanobacteria. Uh, we have major transition sex. Uh, this, of course, on, on the human way, we know that it works with chromosomes. There are several different ways to know how to do it. For example, fungi have uh, between one and 12 mating types or genders. Uh, so, uh, and there's a lot of organisms actually that do not sexual reproduction like rotifers. And so that is something that is probably not a major innovation. This is just one way how it works. And of course, you know, if you need a partner for reproduction, that has some challenges as well. So I don't think really that is one, but there's different ways to do that as well. Uh, multicellularity is one that is often kind of used. And uh, if you look at the branches of the eukaryotic tree, then there's a lot of forms that are just next to each other. Some of them single cellular, some multicellular, some can do both. And the mycobacteria here on the picture are a great example because they can switch from single cellular lifestyle to multicellular lifestyle and back. So what is for us a major leap for, you know, the evolution of life, for biology, it is really not. Then we come into intelligence. So uh, we are not the only intelligent species on our planet. There's also uh, octopus, whales, birds, for example, crows, uh, primates. Uh, so there's a very different animals. And that is probably a result uh, of uh, predation. Because in general, the predator has to be smarter than the prey. So if I'm a lion and I want to eat you as an antelope, I have to anticipate what you do in the future to go and grab you and eat you. Uh, if I'm a wolf, I have to be even smarter than the lion because I'm not that strong. And while I'm hunting a big animal like an elk or so, I have to communicate with my fellow wolves and also not being getting hurt. So uh, this is something that evolves then in some kind of species uh, as an adaptation. Now we have technological intelligence. Of course, that is a little bit more difficult. And again, this is something what we cannot really say because that happened only once as we know on our planet. Um, certainly uh, what is needed is social, being a social animal. Uh, we will refer to national born cyborgs. We have high dexterity in our hands. And of course, our development was uh, aided by the invention of fire language and the heat engine. But again, since it only happened once, we really can't say for sure. Um, so if we summing up, then we can say that the many past process can be shown for all major transitions. And, you know, I haven't listed all this. This one's already in the book listed. For the, except for the origin of life, 
and the rise of technological intelligence. So we know that the origin of life didn't happen as, as we imagined once, you know, after the Miller-Urey experiment, that we have a primordial soup, we have some lightnings inside, some chemicals, and voila, the amoeba grows, uh, grows out of it. Um, but from what we understand, all the ingredients were there and everything happened really fast. But we don't know for 100%. So if the origin of life is extremely unlikely, then we would live in a rather empty universe. But not, if not in a cosmic zoo. That means, you know, we don't know about technological advanced life because it happened only once. But to get to the animal or plant stage should not be that challenging, especially if you have a lot of time. And uh, so if you uh, like to know more, uh, well, the, the book is Cosmic Zoo, Complex Life in the, uh, on Many Worlds, and uh, more detailed in life in the universe. Uh, there's actually from the Cosmic Zoo's book is a German version. And uh, I couldn't help myself uh, to write a science fiction novel. Uh, that was really fun. And if you want to look at my blog, at searchforlifeintheuniverse.com. Thank you. Well, I see, especially I think uh, you know this book, uh, uh, the three minutes first minute of the universe, but you covered uh, <laughs> the, the whole life in 15 minutes. I think you did uh, very good. And actually, you left a bit of time for questions. Okay. But good. before that, I would like, on behalf of the observatory, to give you this. Uh, uh, oh, book. We can okay. Get, uh, okay. Thank uh, you. But uh, any questions? Uh, I have one of you, for that. Because you mentioned that the transition from unicellular to multicellular. Yeah. Um, how special is that? Uh, because I, I was uh, told that maybe we had conditions on Earth which were stable enough that we had a transition to multicellular that uh, uh, are more uh, okay. Uh, more probable than in other worlds. So, uh, and multicellular, this leads to us in a sense. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. so if you have only unicellular organism in the universe, uh, okay, how, yeah. how is your zoo? Uh, well, uh, what we believe right now is that multicellular life originated from colonial, colonial lifestyles. So, I mean, even if you see a biofilm, you know, that plugs your water faucet or something like this, you have a lot of uh, microbes there. Uh, that form colonies and then different one on top of them that <coughs> form colonies. In uh, old earth age, like three and a half billion years ago, we also had stromatolites and so. And as, this is something that just life has a tendency to work together and different microbial life to uh, work together. <coughs> so it is actually not kind of astonishing to develop this kind of ability to do that. And like I said, if you look at the uh, uh, tree of life, there are so many, uh, uh, organisms that uh, basically is on the same level, on the same branch of tree, and they're either single cell or multi cell or they can change, interchange. Oh, interesting. So any question? Yeah, please. Well, made innovation, I would say, or evolutionary jump, if you want to call it yeah. like that. Yeah. Okay, yeah, so. Like in physics, we have a various uh, change of state. So yeah, 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 yeah. This huge uh, transition. Okay, please, Werner. I have a question. Does any proof yeah, whether <clears throat> life began in multicellular or multicellular organisms? Because it's not So, can you repeat the question? Yeah. Uh, well, the question was whether there's any proof <laughs> that li life came from asteroid impacts. Uh, proof not. Uh, there's hypothesis that Earth and Mars life may be related because, you know, for example, it could have a major impact on Mars and then the meteorites on Mars uh, could have basically spawned life on Earth because Martian conditions, the habitability was earlier on, uh, was better than on Earth or, you know, at least comparable. Um, so the Mars meteorite LH84001, what one study showed that the interior of the Mars meteorite was never uh, heated more than 40 degrees C. And of course, if you're within the rock, you're protected as well. So in the principle, what was shown that the mechanism would work or could work and that this could have happened, but we do not have any proof. It could also be that Earth life, early life, uh, 
kind of see that mass line with the other way around. But since uh, the sun is a major gravitation, the most of the flux goes from Mars to Earth rather than Earth to Mars. But you know, since they are relatively close together, you could have that kind of transfer, but there's no proof for that. Excellent. So, okay, a number of uh, questions. So, we, we move to the next talk. On the program, we had a talk on Space Philosophy Laboratory, but uh, uh, Dr. Ozier was not able to attend. But on this topic of um, Space Philosophy Laboratory, I presented a, a number of activities that we have, and you can see that on the website. So, we have um, uh, then uh, uh, Dr. Seth Sostak with, with us. We will expand uh, a bit also some of the realm of what he's going to talk about. And we give him also a bit more time. And uh, but uh, we're starting by answering the question or addressing the question maybe why haven't we found the aliens? So, uh, Seth Shostak, you know, is a well known uh, 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 member, researcher from the SETI Institute, you know, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence which encompasses actually not only the search, but also a lot of supporting research and activities and uh, popularization activities linked with the city. And so, and he's a well-known figure uh, speaking in a whole media. So we are very pleased to have Seth Shostak with us. Thank you very much, Bernard. Okay, well, uh, Dirk has set up my talk by convincing you that there ought to be a lot of planets with life and that there ought to be a lot of planets with intelligent life because intelligence has certain advantages. Maybe some of you may have experienced this personally. I haven't, but that doesn't uh, contradict the hypothesis. In any case, I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about why SETI has, I, I won't say failed, I don't think that's the right verb, but SETI has not yet found the aliens. And SETI, which is by the way, almost my name, uh, my name is Seth, and so I, I guess it's search for extraterrestrial homo chirality, somebody said. Anyhow, SETI has not found the aliens. And is there a good reason for that? How do you explain that? The first SETI experiment was done more than 60 years ago by Frank Drake, a young astronomer. He was 30 years old. He took a job in West Virginia at a radio observatory. And the director of the observatory uh, said to him, look, we have this new antenna we just bought. They didn't build it, they bought it off the shelf. They ordered it on Amazon or something similar. They had this new telescope and he said, think of something to do with it. Frank Drake had always been interested in aliens. I think humans are interested in aliens in the same way that they're interested in dinosaurs. And it's probably an evolutionary thing, right? You're interested in anything with big teeth. Because if you're not, you're probably not still in the gene pool. So aliens are a potential threat, but also something of interest. Now, Frank Drake used this antenna that the uh, observatory had bought, had a dimension of about 21, 22 meters. And uh, it, it was just sitting there. He thought of an experiment that might be able to find the aliens. He would point this antenna had two nearby stars. They were about 11 and 12 light years away, very close stars. They were known to be G-type stars, stars like the sun. And he spent a couple of very cold weeks in April of 1960 pointing the antenna at these stars, hoping to hear a signal from ET. And the funny thing was, he looked at the first star and didn't hear anything. So they you know, swung the telescope over to the second star and suddenly he did hear something. He heard whoop, 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 whoop. And, you know, his first thought, so he told me, was can it be this easy to find the aliens? Well, what he had found, in fact, was the US Air Force, which had radars in its planes. And as a consequence, uh, that, that's what happened. Oh, I'm told that I should use these slides. These slides are mostly about my last summer vacation. Yeah, yeah, left or right? Just click on the left. Left. Okay. All right. Now, some people will say that we have found the aliens. Frank Drake didn't find the aliens. He found the, uh, the Pentagon. But there have been experiments since then to try and find the aliens. And this is perhaps the most famous controversial detection. This was made in 1977 at the Ohio State University, which not coincidentally is located in Ohio. 
Uh, it's uh, near Columbus, Ohio. And it was a telescope that, a radio telescope that wasn't very useful in 1977. It was uh, overtaken by more modern technology. But the university just parked this telescope, aimed at the, the zenith, just aimed at the sky, and just slowly let the, well, they didn't have any control over this. They just let the earth rotate so they would sweep a path across the sky. And every two or three days, one of the astronomers would go into the shack next to the telescope, look at the computer printout to see if there was anything interesting. And one day, uh, the astronomer Jerry Amon was his name, he saw a very strong signal. And he was so impressed that he wrote wow next to it. So this has been known as the wow signal ever since. Now, what was it? Um, I don't think it was aliens, but nobody knows what it was. This telescope actually had two receivers. So one minute after the first detection, the second receiver also looked at this part of the sky and didn't find anything. So what does that mean? Well, it could have been ET, but that maybe ET went on a lunch break, right? Between the first observation and the second one. We don't know. It could have been a Ohio State University undergraduate prank. Nobody knows, but in any case, this is a famous one, but you will not be able to find much about this in your local science museum here in Berlin because scientists don't believe this was a, a, a verified detection of ET. Next slide. Wait, 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 try it. Okay. Uh, this, is, this is considered by many Americans to be proof that there are aliens because they think the aliens are visiting Earth. Now, they don't seem to visit Europe quite as much. I'm not sure why that is. It could be the lack of fast food. But in any case, this is one of several videos that uh, surfaced and were published actually in the New York Times in 2017. There were three of them. They were made by Navy fighter jet pilots uh, operating off the coast of San Diego in Southern California. These are infrared cameras, so that dark spot in the middle is something hot. Now, these cameras were not designed to find aliens. They were designed to find enemy aircraft. So the question is, well, what was this thing? And uh, there were certain pilots that were very much in love with the idea that aliens would come light years to Earth just to annoy Navy pilots, to annoy our top gun. So that's what they think it is. I don't think it's uh, aliens, but one third of all Americans do. That's 100 million people on the other side of the Atlantic who think we've already found the aliens. Okay. Like, I wonder what I just turned on, somebody's television somewhere. Okay, so the bottom line of this rather lengthy introduction is that we haven't found anything. And why is that? Well, I'm just gonna give you a laundry list of some of the possibilities for why we haven't found the aliens. And this laundry list is somewhat technical, not that the discussion is technical, but the, the reasons that we might not have found the aliens may have more to do with the experiment than anything else. All right, to begin with, we just haven't looked in enough places. Now, you know, th these are the antennas, by the way, that we use at the SETI Institute. These are located in Northern California in the Cascade Mountains. The next time you come to California, you can skip going to Los Angeles, skip going to San Francisco, you can go here. There's no food. And, you know, and it's often cold in the winter, but on the other hand, you get to see all these nice antennas. So you can make selfies there. There are 42 of these antennas now. The hope was to build 350, but we ran out of money. These are used all the time to look for the aliens. But even with that kind of effort, we've still only looked at about 5,000 star systems since Frank Drake's experiment 62 years ago, 5,000. In astronomy, 5,000 is not a very big number. Right, and the reason for this is one, money. This is not a government experiment. This is not a NASA experiment anymore. It hasn't been a NASA experiment for almost 30 years now. It's not done anywhere else than in California. That's sociology. That says something either about Californians or about the rest of the world, right? Why is it that there's no such experiment being run in Europe? There's not. The only Europeans to have done any serious SETI experiments were the Italians, mostly at the University of Bologna, right? The Italians, well, they have a history of finding ET actually, right? I mean, uh, Scaparelli saw the, the, the canals on Mars, right? Uh, Marconi thought he had picked up 
Martian radio transmission. So the Italians are optimistic that ET is out there and they were willing to look. No other country, and that includes Germany, it also includes France, the UK, name any other country you like, Montenegro, none of them have done this. And I think that there's actually a good PhD thesis in that. Why is it that the Americans are doing all of these experiments and nobody else? The Chinese say they are interested, they have a big new telescope, maybe they will do it. The only ex answer I have for this, which I, as I say, I think it is an interesting question. I gave a talk on SETI where I used to work in the Netherlands at a university there. And uh, I asked everybody in the audience, it was a big audience, I said, how many of you think there are aliens to be found? And all the hands went up. So I followed that question with another question. How many of you are willing to spend one guilder, which is about a half a euro, one guilder a year, not a day, a year to look? And all the hands went down. This is Holland, remember? They're, they're known for being cheap. Okay, so, so, so why is that? Why is it? And I asked one of the professors, I said, why, why, do you, why don't you look? You have the equipment, you have the expertise, right? You have the money, but you still don't look. And they say, yeah, now Darzane, but to look therefore, which in Dutch means we're too sober to do it. In other words, it's a sociology problem. It's, it's not, you know, that they don't think they're aliens to be found. They just don't think it's a good use of their equipment. Okay, so maybe that's the answer. We just haven't looked uh, hard enough. I point out to you that by 2030, SETI experiments, the ones in California, which are the only ones so far, will have looked at more than a million star systems. A million is a lot different than 5,000. So uh, at a moment of indiscretion and a talk I was giving in a part of Germany to the west of here, I bet everybody in the audience a cup of coffee that will find ET by 2035. I will do the same with you. If we don't find ET or somebody doesn't find ET by 2035, right? So what is it, 12 or 13 years from now? You know, it's not a dead loss for you because at least you get a cup of coffee. You'll have something to talk about at uh, dinner. Can raise the bet? <laughs> raise the bet. No, I, I'm under pressure to lower the bet. Okay, maybe we're just looking in the wrong places. Where do we find ET? Nobody knows. Right, that depends on what ET is like, and Dirk has already told you that they might have a biology that you know follows similar rules to our own. Uh, these are the kind of ingredients that you use to make a cosmic zoo, and so we we tend to look in the direction of star systems that have planets somewhat like the Earth. Now we don't know if they're like the Earth; we don't have that kind of data yet. But we do know, based on wild extrapolations of existing Kepler data that roughly one out of every two sun-like stars, one out of every two, maybe every three, has a planet about the same mass as the Earth and at the same average temperature as the Earth. In other words, at the right distance from that star. So that means that there are like 100 billion cousins of Earth in our galaxy. So that sounds like a big enough number to find somebody. I've already said that, so I won't say it again. Of course, this does assume that the uh, aliens need a planet with liquid water, sunlight, some energy source and all the, all the usual things. And that may be wrong. That may be a very uh, anthropocentric argument. I actually consult for science fiction films occasionally because there's an office down in Hollywood that uh, when they hear that a producer or a director or a writer is gonna write a, a a film that involves aliens, they'll say, would, would you like to talk to a scientist about it? And most of them say, no, we don't, we don't need that. But some of them say yes, because it doesn't cost them anything. So, uh, you know, they'll come up uh, to the SETI Institute or they'll fly me down to Los Angeles or they'll just call me up on the phone and they ask the usual questions about aliens. You know, why have they come to Earth? They only come to Earth to flatten Los Angeles, by the way. Uh, that's the only real reason. And secondly, what do they look like? And, uh, you know, the third thing is what weapons do they have, right? But that's important for the movie, but of course we have no idea what weapons they have. But the second question, what do they look like? That is something that is interesting, at least at some level. And Dirk has talked about the cosmic zoo. So, you know, they look like animals, but think about what's happening in this century. This is a really important century. I'm sure every century thought it was important, but this century, 
It's important because we're finally understanding biology. That's gonna mean that, you know, you're gonna die of a disease that two weeks later will be cured by, by science. So that, that's a good thing. Uh, the second thing that's happening is we will start having people living off the earth. We're gonna hear talks about that, right? Not everybody will be constrained to have to live on this planet all their lives. That's gonna happen. The third thing is I think we're gonna find ET, otherwise I have to buy a lot of coffee, okay? So those are the things that are gonna happen this century. The most important thing though, by far the most important thing is what's happening where I live in the Silicon Valley and other places like it. And that is the invention of generalized artificial intelligence. Today, you can spend a lot of money and build a computer that can beat you at cards, chess, go, any of these things, that's great. But if you ask it simple questions like, you know, write an interesting piece of music, it can't do it very well, right? But that's gonna change by the end of the century. I was uh, at Stanford University a couple of years ago for some television show. And the head of the Stanford Artificial Intelligence Lab was sitting there. He was sitting there with his, hand in, his head in his hands. He was bored by the whole thing. I went up to him and I said, look, are we going to have a computer by 2050 that can write the great American novel? And he looked up at me and he said, yes. And then he went back to sleep. Okay, so that's gonna change everything because as soon as you have a, a, a computer with generalized intelligence, the kind that comes out of the school systems, once you have that, the first thing you ask it to do is design a machine smarter than you are. And you build that, you design a machine smarter than you are and you build that. And within 30 years, you have one machine that's smarter than all humans put together. Now, some of you might consider this a depressing idea, but it's not so depressing. You know, you just send, send one of these machines to your, your workplace and you just sit at home and watch bad television all day. So it might not be a bad thing. Anyhow, the point is that knowing that this is what's going to happen to us, presumably it's what's happened to some of the aliens. Not the dumb ones, not the Neanderthal aliens, but we're not gonna find them anyhow because they're not building big transmitters to make radio signals. But the smart ones are, and the chances are, it seems to me, the chances are overwhelming that the aliens will be machines. Okay, now, uh, this is just another uh, plot that, that illustrates it. I'm sorry I'm going on, but I was told that I have to replace the next 16 yeah. talks. Yeah. Okay. So five minutes. Five minutes? Five minutes. Oh, <laughs> I'm, I'm three percent of the way in. Is that good enough? Okay. Yeah, you can see here the, the rise in the capabilities of computers. This is from a, a fellow at Carnegie Mellon Institute. Uh, Carnegie Mellon uh, University in, in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. But you can see that by 2022, today, in other words, for $1,000, you can buy a, compute, a computer that has the same data processing rate as your brain, okay? So you can already outsource your job if you want to. All right. Now, this is a reason number three. We simply don't have adequate sensitivity to find the signals. There are signals from aliens that are falling through this building as you sit through this, right? But you're not aware of them because you don't have enough sensitivity in your receivers. This is a hard thing to fix, but it's slowly being fixed by uh, Europe and North America building bigger telescopes. I, I won't give you the numbers. Suffice it to say that new telescopes like this one, the uh, square kilometer array, which is being built in the Southern hemisphere, Western Australia, and also South Africa, these will increase the sensitivity of SETI experiments by about a factor of 10. They're not being built for SETI, they're being built for astronomy, but they will have the ancillary benefit of being able to do that. This is the new uh, fast antenna in China. I don't know how many of you have gone there to look at it, uh, you know, enjoy a nice meal somewhere in the neighborhood. It's 500 meters across, okay? This is, this is much bigger. The one in Puerto Rico was 300 meters across. It collapsed. This is not only the biggest one, but it's the only big one, and it's in China. This is the last thing I think I'm going to uh, address, and then maybe if, there's, if you need to fill some time, I, I have some planted questions here. Um, and that is, it may be that the reason we haven't found ET is that there's nothing to find. And that's kind of an interesting idea, but it requires that you believe that there's something very special about you. And you probably do think there's something very special about you because you know your parents told you that, for most of your life, but it may not be true. And as Dirk has already said, there's so many pathways 
to getting to something like intelligence, right? That it's hard to believe that you are actually the smartest species in the universe. If you are, you should ask your boss for a raise, actually, I guess, if you want to do that. This, this is a possibility, and there are people who believe it. There's something called the Fermi paradox, which plays on this idea, saying, you know, there can't be any aliens because we don't see any evidence of aliens. Some of them should have colonized the entire galaxy by now, which doesn't take very long. Right? To colonize the entire galaxy, even the kind of technology we have, is like 30 million years, right? So it's comparable to, to waiting for the Espan. It's not that long. 20 or 30 million years. And uh, so the fact that we don't see that, uh, we don't see evidence of the aliens may mean something. I don't think that it does. But again, I will say to you what I said to that audience in Hamburg years ago, either we find ET before you're another 10 years older or I will buy you a cup of coffee. So you cannot lose. Either you'll have something to talk to your spouse about over dinner or you get a cup of coffee. Thank you very much. Thanks, thanks very much for uh, you stay here. And uh, okay, before I would like on behalf of the observatory and the organizer to give you this bleak in the spread hall. Right? Thank you. <laughs> and uh, so, uh, and we open the floor for questions after this uh, provocative, um, humorous uh, yeah. <laughs> talk. Uh, so, are there some questions? Okay, and for this, uh, we have a microphone that can be circulated. So, if we yeah. Well, uh, but uh, I think we have some young volunteers that can also do the running <laughs> and help uh, Sabino to do that. But we need a microphone man. So, so if you want to do, can come. Thank you. And uh, can you identify yourself also when you ask a question? Excellent. <laughs> Hi, doctor. I have an update on safety in uh, safety research in China. Is that as far as I know, we have started research on SEBI from September 2020, <coughs> and researchers have found two sets of suspicious signals in 2020 and one set of signal, signal in uh, 2022, this year, last month, actually. Um, and I also read that um, last month, Japan has found over 20 kinds of amino acid from one of the, their um, um, robots from a small like star. Have you read about that? Okay, so, so you, 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 yeah. you want to answer the first one on the- well, Why don't I just summarize your first question, yeah, yeah. which was uh, that you had read about a month ago, there was a story that came out of the fast telescope, the big one in China, yeah. that they had found a signal coming from some nearby star, right? Actually, I think uh, it was Proxima Centauri B. I don't think it's a nearby star, but um, I think it's pretty far. Like, I, I don't know about the details, but in total, um, China has already received three sets of signals. Right. Very yeah, I, I think it's the same story. They, they have found signals, but let me simply, now I don't want to burst any bubbles. But the facts are that when you turn on a big antenna with a receiver that can monitor 100 million separate channels or frequencies simultaneously, you find signals all the time, right? And it's because we have, you know, a space industry that puts satellites around the Earth. It's mostly that. These satellites are selling, uh, t sending telecommunication back to Earth. They produce signals that we pick up all the time, and you have to be able to, uh, to, to deal with that. And in fact, the researchers in China have admitted, or admitted is a loaded word, but they have said that most likely it's, yes, they found an intelligent species, but it was homo sapiens. Okay. <laughs> okay. All right. And the second question was- uh, About amino acids. Uh, oh, amino acids. Yeah. Amino acids are very easy to make. I mean, you can, uh, uh, Dirk talked about the Miller-Urey experiment that was done at the University of Chicago in 1953, I believe. And, you know, they just took some gases that they thought were similar to the atmosphere of the earth, you know, three and a half, four billion years ago, put an electric spark through it to simulate lightning. And, you know, after a week, they got this brown muck that contained amino acids. 
You can make amino acids in your sleep. They're so easy to make. You find them in meteors, you know, asteroids and so forth. So amino acids are great, but it's like saying that if you go, you know, five kilometers west of Cairo, you see all this, the sandstone, right? Yeah, there's a lot of sandstone, but that doesn't mean that you get pyramids all the time. It takes something else. Yeah, I, that's not what I mean. What I mean is that I think this is the base of actually having um, life creatures that's probably similar to um, life creatures on the Earth. Like there is a very high possibility that um, eventually we might be able to find them. Yeah, well, I agree with you. I agree. Yeah, I mean, there are building blocks. Huh? First, uh, yeah. you have the chemical elements and building blocks, you have molecular building blocks. But of course, there are a very long path from these building blocks uh, to the right. uh, possible uh, first life. That's uh, something that we should really discuss further. Um, any other question from uh, the room? Please uh, don't hesitate. In the meantime, I'm going to ask you one. Oh. Uh, so, yeah, you, you have this uh, answer no aliens, but uh, in a sense, there are various, uh, uh, you want aliens that can communicate, so that the technology, uh, there is a lifetime uh, when uh, we can, uh, we will be able to communicate, for instance, depending how uh, wise we are to manage uh, uh, our planet. So how far are we now in some of these factors of the so-called Drake equation? Yeah. So are we a communicating society? And the answer is yes, right? The ZDF, right, the television, broadcasters are broadcasting into space every day. Not deliberately, they don't get any, uh, <laughs> they don't get any advertising from the aliens that would help their bottom line. But in fact, those signals do go out into space, all high frequency signals. The strongest si signals from Earth, in case you're worried about this, the strongest signals from Earth are radars. But you have radars down at the local airport, right? And uh, you know, so there's some people who worry about the fact that we're broadcasting into space. There's a whole contingent of SETI astronomers who think that government ought to step in and forbid transmissions to the sky because you might just wake somebody up and then they'll come to Earth and flatten Los Angeles, right? Uh, that, that, that could be, but I don't worry about that. And you don't want to turn off the radars at the local airport anyhow. So I think it's kind of dumb, but we've only been broadcasting since the Second World War. So it's not very long. Yeah, but uh, okay, back to this uh, direct equation. So now, for instance, there, there is a factor which is, uh, okay, number of stars in the galaxies, how, uh, how many planets they have. Now we have some more concrete answers. Uh, typically, we have a, a stellar system around each star and possibly, uh, okay, 30% Earth-like uh, planet around them. So we start to have a good idea of uh, habitable uh, stellar systems. One other question is about emerging life in those worlds. This I see that, okay, we have to ask Dirk to quantify this, but um, what about, uh, yeah, the, the length of a civilization that we transmit uh, your yeah. radio, that's what you were mentioning. I think Bernard is asking, uh, there, there are two things there. One, just because you have a, a million planets or a thousand million planets like the earth, does that mean that you get life very often? And the answer to that question is, we don't know the answer to that question. But on the other hand, it happened on Earth very quickly. And uh, that's at least suggestive that it isn't a very hard experiment. Not everybody agrees with that. Okay, so having a lot of planets does not guarantee that you will get a lot of life. But Bernard is asking about the last term in the Drake equation. And if you don't know the Drake equation, just look it up. It'll be good for you know what remains of your soul to know what the Drake equation is. The last term in the Drake equation, the one that's least known, is suppose you get to the stage of technology where we are, where you can build a strong radio transmitter or a giant laser. How long do you last before something terrible happens to you to wipe out your species? Most likely you've done it to yourselves. Maybe that's what happens, right? And again, we don't know the answer to that. All we know is we've had radio for 50 or 100 years and that's it. If you think that all homo sapiens are going to go away in the next hundred years, then maybe that's why we don't find the aliens. They do the same thing. Okay, excellent. We still have three minutes uh, for another question. If there's uh, somebody in the audience. Uh, okay, another one then. And uh, what about the far side of the moon? 
to do uh, such for extraterrestrial intelligence because it's uh, very radio quiet. What should we do for that? Yeah, absolutely. The far side of the moon has been suggested. Uh, there's an Italian astronomer, Claudio Marconi. Yeah. Uh, you go in the field. Oh, they don't need to see me. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's an aesthetic offense. And they should just listen to you. Yeah, that's a... <laughs> hey, yeah, the far side of the moon has lots of craters that are pretty much brown. And so what you could do is just line those craters with you know wire mesh or solid aluminum or something and make a very, very big telescope. But the big advantage of putting it on the far side of the moon is not the cuisine because uh, lunar cuisine is not known to be very good. The big advantage is that if you're on the back side of the moon, the far side of the moon, you are always shielded from radio interference from the earth. That's the big advantage. Unfortunately, this, this advantage will probably go away pretty soon because NASA wants to put something at the, the Lagrange point number two, and that will ruin the backside of the moon. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Seth Shostak. And uh, okay, we are exactly on time to go forward to the moon. And uh, for this, uh, uh, we have the pleasure to have uh, with us uh, uh, Dr. Giuseppe Ribaldi. Uh, he's the president of the Moon Village Association. Actually, I've met him as we have been working in the same uh, establishment, uh, STEC, uh, ESA Space Research and Technology Centers. And um, okay, we have the good opportunity to, uh, to interact. And when we started actually 25 years ago to develop the concept of Moon Village uh, uh, in the international community, uh, and we had our director general of ESA as an ambassador of this program, uh, say Dr. Rebaldi also followed this up to develop a really a grassroots uh, movement covering many aspects of what we need to do for the Moon Village implementation. And even he will talk about a special success, which is uh, International Moon Day that we are going to celebrate uh, for the first time this year on 20th of July. So Giuseppe Rebaldi, president of the Moon Village Association. The floor is yours. Okay, thank you. First of all, can you hear me? And can you see the, the, the PowerPoint? Can you hear me? Can you see the PowerPoint? Giuseppe? Hello? Can you hear me? Bernard, can you hear me? Giuseppe? No, I'm not. Let me see. Uh, I think uh, your microphone is muted. I see a red uh, dot on it, uh, Yeah. No, but can you hear no. me now? Let me try to remove. We don't hear you. Do you have, uh, you, you have the volume on that? Your sound volume is, is up. Yeah, this volume here. Are you on the maximum? Let me try to remove. Okay. Okay, so we have you. We copy you. Over. Thank you. Your sound volume is up. this volume Are you on the maximum? <laughs> Bernard, can you hear me? Bernard, can you hear me? Okay. Bernard, can you hear me? Yes. Great. Okay. All right, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. These are the usual technical problem when you are not physically present. Yeah, uh, so, 
Okay, thank you. So first of all, let me try first uh, before I start to put the PowerPoint. Uh, so let me try to share the screen. Uh, this, this is the next, it's probably more difficult than to find aliens. So let me try to well, see. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, this is uh, the usual technical problem when you are not physically present. Yeah. So, okay, yeah. thank you. So first of all, let me try first uh, before I start to put the PowerPoint. Uh, so let me try to share the screen. Can you see the screen, uh, Bernard? It's probably more difficult than to find aliens. So let me try. Can you see me? Can you hear? Okay, I'm going to go ahead. So uh, if if you can, if you cannot hear me, I I will start the presentation. Okay. Uh, uh, so thank you to, to the organizer of, the, uh, of this meeting, and particularly uh, to Bernard and of course to Adriano for organizing uh, uh, this event. So I will shortly present you the implementation of the Moon Village and the International Moon Day. Uh, so uh, basically uh, I will explain what, Bernard, can you hear me or, or you can't? Yes, yes, we can hear you. Everything is uh, nominal. Thank you. Okay. okay, I'm sorry because I cannot get it. Okay, so therefore, first of all, let me explain what is the Moon Village Association. As, uh, as Bernard indicated, uh, uh, the concept uh, of the Moon Village has been around for some time uh, in, the, in the few years ago, even 20, 30 years ago, and then has been uh, re bought up uh, also thanks to Professor Werner. Uh, however, what was missing? is uh, the fact that uh, there was no organization that will basically be created to implement this uh, vision. So the vision of the Moon Village is a vision of uh, stakeholder uh, cooperating peacefully for the exploration of the moon and utilization. So we created uh, in 2017 an NGO, which is called Moon Village Association. Many of you, including Bernard and a few others, were present at the meeting, uh, uh, at the starting meeting, the founding meeting, which took place in Strasbourg in uh, November 2017. So MVA is a member of the IF as well as observing the United Nations. And we play, I think, an important role in the COPOS, as we will see later, because of many uh, issues related with policy, which are required uh, to organize a peaceful exploration of the moon. So the association is basically a platform, a forum to advance uh, the development of the Moon Village uh, involving industry, government, space agency, international organization, NGO, and the public at large. So right now we have about 800 individuals uh, from about 60 countries, and you can see the statistic there. And uh, uh, basically you can join as an individual as well as an institutional member. And uh, you can see the number there. So uh, we are acting also as a catalyst to try to solicit investment for the development of a lunar economy uh, where we have a lot of activity. So uh, I will just uh, show to you without getting too much detail of the palette of activity that the organization is carrying out. You can see details on uh, the website. So it is uh, basically activity uh, in the organized for a working group or project which are basically ranging from analog uh, uh, towards uh, moon village generation, which is capacity building for the young generation, lunar commerce and economic, a portfolio of nine different uh, lunar markets are being developed. Cultural is an important aspect uh, uh, of the organization, uh, as well as uh, we are dealing also with some hardware issue. We are developing the first payload, which will be a camera, uh, to be mounted on a lunar lander in order to recreate the overview effect. Uh, we have also policy uh, working group, which is uh, adaptive governance. And I will talk briefly about that later, as well as architecture concept. What you see behind me is uh, one of the result of the OASIS 2045. is the only multi-stakeholder, uh, let me say, study related to how it's going to look like 
uh, a moon village, uh, which include a number of different building blocks uh, at the South Pole. And you can see uh, on, on my back, you can see also in the far away Shackleton craters where the production of the ice uh, uh, will, will take place. We are also uh, very careful and very, uh, let's say, important uh, the uh, participation of space emergency country. Differently from the International Space Station, where I had worked for uh, 16 years, uh, we need to make sure that uh, the moon uh, village and the next exploration for humankind is really shared by as many countries as possible. And that's the reason it's so important to try to engage those countries which do not have at the moment the capability to develop lunar harvest, but they are still very much keen in participating. So what I'm going to give you, just an example of some of the activity of the organization, because we have no time and there is no reason to go in more detail. I will go to talk about lunar governance. Now, uh, there has been, uh, as you know, in 2022, to start with, there are many missions. Uh, we have got Capstone, as you know, it's been launched. The next one is going to be the Korean mission and the more will follow. Uh, and so in some cases, we will have also a number of uh, missions which are going to be very close in location at the South Pole, as well as a similar orbit. So uh, the lack of coordination mechanism could lead indeed to harmful interference between all these different missions. So there is a need to create confidence building uh, and to foster peaceful cooperation. So that's the reason why the organization decided to set up a global expert group on sustainable activity, short Gexler, which is a multi-stakeholder where we have space agency, government, industry, and academia participating, as well as civil society and the public. What is the goal of this group, which has been initiated uh, last year, is to create a document which is called Recommended Framework in Key Elements for Peaceful and Sustainable Rural Activity. And this document includes principal key element as well as a number of uh, guidelines. Uh, uh, this is uh, what you can see there is, uh, is the way uh, this year is being organized uh, and in particular the, the number of meetings which we are having. I just want to bring uh, the attention on two specific items. One is related to the external consultation, uh, uh, which you can find on the MVA website and Gexla. Uh, uh, you are able to participate because many of the issues uh, which uh, will needed for the lunar governance are very controversial. And so in order to expand the basis of these issues, uh, we are asking opinion of different uh, stakeholders. Uh, so please, uh, you are welcome to fill in the form and provide it. The goal of all this activity is to go to Corpus and present those findings in 2023. At the last uh, plenary of the Corpus, uh, about a couple of months ago, uh, it has been provisionally agreed that that will be the case uh, at the next uh, year. And so we will be pleased together with a number of countries which consider that these issues important to bring uh, these uh, to the attention of the different uh, member states and organizations. So please, it's very important uh, to operate in a concrete way to try to find a way to have uh, agreement on how to behave uh, on the moon. At the moment, we do not have, and this could create a problem. So then uh, I just want to wrap up the MV activity just to indicate that we are also present uh, um, on, the, on, the, on the site. And so we have 49 national coordinator and six regional coordinator. And we have regularly called for a new national and regional coordinator. So you can see the sketch there. So of course, again, you are welcome uh, to try to participate in many activity. Let me now turn uh, to the second, uh, before I go to that, is a reminder that we have um, uh, every year, the organization has a, a workshop, like it was the funding workshop in 2017. So we, this year is going to be the sixth, uh, and it's going to take place hopefully in Los Angeles. Uh, we were in Los Angeles three years ago. The way the organization works is that we move continent every year. Of course, the last two years, COVID has uh, put a break to this. So eventually the meeting has been held online only, like most of uh, us has been doing. So therefore, I think what, what is important is uh, uh, that uh, you are welcome to join this meeting and there are still possibility to present uh, basically uh, papers. So let me go to the other point which Bernard 
indicated uh, international Monday. So what is this international Monday? So the origin is uh, that uh, the Moon Village Association uh, proposed to the Corpus the creation of, uh, of this uh, event to celebrate uh, on the 20th of July uh, the lunar landing uh, for uh, not only for United States, but for humanity, as well as for the other country, which had important mission to the moon. So uh, following this uh, proposal, uh, I have to say the planet of Copos uh, approved, uh, endorsed it, and then very quickly uh, in December, uh, uh, the General Assembly made the, the final endorsement. And so uh, we have uh, officially uh, got uh, an approval. So like some of the other dates, like Asteroid Day, as well as, uh, let's say, World Space Week Association, this is a, a third date together with the uh, URI Night or Human Space Flight Day, uh, which is going to celebrate. And this year is the first uh, day, is the first of this celebration. So what is it? And what is uh, like any other of this event has got a team, and the team is very much uh, complementary or synergetic to some of the activity of the NBA. In particularly, this year we like uh, many of the events uh, which are going to take place around the world to talk about lunar exploration, coordination, and sustainability, because this will create a complementarity of what we are doing for the GEXLA. So what are the objectives? The objective is uh, uh, basically to celebrate, uh, uh, to commemorate, of course, what it means, because all the young generation did not know, did not feel the excitement like, like I did, Bernard and many of our people of our age, uh, what was the excitement of that day on the 20th of July. So we will try to try to bring to them a little bit of this feeling by uh, remembering and celebrating. So there is an historical part, but most likely and the strategic aspect of the International Moon Day is to foster international cooperation. Because the, as you will see, we are organizing, uh, the world is organizing bottom-up event and top-down event. And so I think it's important uh, that uh, this date is used uh, to uh, think and to discuss with the public about what, what is about the moon. So, uh, as I said, we have two types of event, bottom-up event, which are organized uh, by different organizations. Uh, right now, we are about 25 countries, as you will see briefly later. Uh, the main goal is, as I said, to raise awareness of all the missions going to the moon. People don't understand why there are all these missions going to the moon and what is in for them, as well as to, to educate and inspire the young generation. So we have target audience, which are also uh, uh, young age, as well as older. And it is also an opportunity for capacity building and regional development. And, and this will happen not necessarily only on 20 of July, but also in different dates. The same uh, Bernard and uh, a number of people are proposed to organize an event at COSPAR, uh, uh, which will uh, Taking, is taking place during that week. So I'm just going to give you, and as you can see on the website, some of the events which are being organized. You will find them more detail uh, on, your, on your website. So you might find out uh, whether uh, close to you, there is an event uh, already organized. This is just to give you a, an example. As I said, uh, on the website, you will find uh, at least 20 to 25 more of these events. And uh, of course, uh, the time is, a is of course uh, expired, but if you are still interested to organize event, uh, please contact us and, uh, and of course we will be pleased to include you. The goal of all this event is that next year, we hope that uh, all the organization which did make that event this year will cooperate uh, overseas or with other, uh, let's say, uh, organization in order to increase the cooperation and uh, uh, basically the outreach of the lunar exploration. So this is another example. We have also Space Generation Advisory Council and many, many developing countries which are organized. Again, take this as an example. Uh, you will have more detail. Finally, uh, the top-down event uh, is going to be organized uh, uh, basically in Huntsville, Alabama. We have been uh, thinking of different options, but finally we settled on Huntsville, Alabama because this is from where everything started. You know very well the origin of the Apollo program, Von Braun, 
the Saturn V uh, and many other participated, but we feel that historically uh, Marshall uh, and Huntsville has a strong, uh, if not a determined legacy uh, with the first uh, moon lunar landing. So we felt that the first International Moon Day uh, uh, top-down event should take place uh, in Huntsville. So this is what uh, is going to happen. Details of this event uh, are going to be posted uh, by the end uh, of this week, uh, basically, which is tomorrow. And there will be a number of keynote speech from space agency, as well as lunar expert, as well as uh, round table. Uh, and so with that, uh, Bernard, uh, I think I am on time. So I'd like to thank you. I think uh, this is the end of, of my presentation. So there are information about uh, gathering all sorts of, uh, uh, let's say, uh, Facebook, uh, LinkedIn, about International Moon Day and how you can participate. So with that, Bernard, uh, I hope you have been able to follow. Yeah, thank you so much. Yes, uh, great. Thanks for being uh, some effective and uh, concise. And okay, great work on all these uh, uh, topics, uh, working group, and we are all going to celebrate International Moon Day. You mentioned I'll do it from COSPA in Athens, but I'm sure many groups from Space Renaissance and other groups will also celebrate uh, in their own uh, country. So thanks very much, uh, Giuseppe, and uh, yeah, looking forward uh, also to the next event. You have one Moon Village Association um, uh, symposium in Los Angeles in November, I understand. Correct. 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 Yeah. Correct. So we will, yeah, we will have uh, some people from your organization joining us uh, and having a, a good uh, presentation of, of development. And of course, uh, if I may add, uh, Bernard, just uh, for the people which are organizing event on the International Day, give us uh, the feedback. Because uh, the, the more the feedback we get, we are going to include in the report to the United Nations uh, uh, corpus. We like uh, World Space Week Association, as you know, publish every year a report of the event. So we'll do the same. So it will be nice to hear uh, from the people which had the event uh, about the International Moon Day. That's all. Okay, so thank you. And I want to give you also the best from all the audience here and from the Ashen Old Observatory. The, I have a special gift for you. So next time I meet you, I will bring you this, uh, this book. And uh, so, uh, and I encourage you to come back here. A lot of beautiful moon and space artifacts. So thank you very much, uh, Giuseppe. Bye thank bye. you to you. Thank you to you. Thank you, and I wish you a good Congress. Thank you. Excellent. And then uh, we are exactly on time. Oh my God, that's a, a, a countdown without the any- first time in history. Uh, yeah, no, 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 <laughs> no. That's a, uh, and uh, that's an ancient old uh, influence. And uh, uh, the next uh, talk is uh, on contextual reading of science fiction literature. How can we be prepared for space? By uh, Dominic Intenkauf. So if you want to introduce uh, yourself and uh, yeah, then you have the floor. Okay. Yeah, hello. I'm Dominic Oedenkauf. I'm in the organizing team of a science fiction convention next year in May in Berlin. And I'd like to speak a little bit about my um, curatorial um, task and how I like, um, I read science fiction literature in regards to um, space exploration. Can I? Yes, you do. That is. Yes. Okay. First slide, then. Next slide. Yeah. So science fiction literature and space travel has a long and old friendship. And in classic US science fiction, life on other planets is a similar topic, like um, being written uh, works by Isaac Asimov in his foundation trilogy. <clears throat> and there is an extensive occupation with different aspects. 
but mostly um, the science fiction writers concentrate on the uh, social aspects, technical as well, but you uh, will uh, only rarely find like uh, detailed descriptions of like um, how to get to space. Um, there is like um, uh, special technologies that in the classic science fiction are not really based on like the um, state of the art and state of the technology at this time, but um, are really like more speculative and more uh, based on fantasy. But it is very interesting to get like the ideas and the thoughts and like to develop wishes to leave Earth, what reasons and what kinds of storytelling can be developed by reading science fiction to uh, get the motivation to get started. And of course, before them, uh, Shul Graham started the whole topic with his moon novels and that is reading and comparing different fields and works. So next slide. And um, this is starting from daily work, like reviewing books, or re uh, I get recommended, uh, books are recommended to me, or uh, like the networking and exchanging opinions and knowledge, writing articles and including different works, disperses and sources. And when I like compile different works from science fiction literature, you can really like um, recognize um, a tendency or like an evolution from this classic science fiction works to get more realistic uh, in the course of time. And what helps me in my work and for um, choosing writers and experts for festival that is planned next year in Berlin is to um, uh, my studies of comparative literature. It invites to um, practical always the so-called tertium comparationis, like um, a missing, like the uh, combining link. So how can you bring topics together? But um, as I said, it is a more easier task with science fiction and space exploration because space exploration is understood as a very, um, very common and generic topic for this kind of literature. But then again, you have to take a step um, back and ask again, is it really so um, like self-explanatory or do we have to like um, view it from different angles? So a definition for science fiction literature is not easy to find. And this genre has been developing ever since, like I said, and science seems to play a role in it and it revolves around fiction. So how can I put both together? And the science doesn't only mean physics, chemistry, biology, and the other natural sciences, but later humanities and cultural studies entered uh, science fiction bureaus as well. And sociology becomes a strong pillar of science fiction, especially when we go into outer space, it is um, connected to inner space. So what can happen when I um, begin to venture into outer space? What happens uh, inside the astronauts and what happens inside the society that decides or the group of people that decide to go to leave Earth for um, different and um, far planets. So it introduces what I call serious speculation. It is uh, based on um, facts and knowledge. Now, even more than in um, the first uh, classic years of science fiction, and it's getting more realistic uh, over time. So one example, um, uh, a recent example of um, space exploration in science fiction is the um, series, the so-called Lady Astronaut series, written by the uh, writer Mary Robinette Cowell. She describes an alternate history. What would have happened when Lady Astronauts entered space in the 1960s? And in her books, she, she always like talks about political 
uh, political empowerment, women's lib, like um, the fight against racism that um, protrudes and influences astronautics as well. Um, sometimes like science fiction literature is understood or astronautics is understood as very technological and very scientific, but these um, new kind of science fiction writers really like um, uh, underline the social aspects of uh, going into space as well, or the question what nations can really afford going into space and how is the uh, whole technology and knowledge distributed among the different continents? Uh, what about Africa, for example? Will they have a chance to go into space as well? As well or do they only have the chance to go by being uh, or by like um, uh, finding links to American or European um, existing agencies? So these books, they tell their stories when we read them differently and when we connect the different discourses that are being uh, infused into this um, kind of books and literature. And another example which got quite popular by being filmed as a movie is uh, Andy Wire's The Martian and he um, continued this series uh, of space exploration with um, the Artemis novel and the astronaut novel. And so this is, again, another example of recent science fiction insofar as Andy Weir is uh, interested in the processes and the procedures and uh, the different uh, chances and challenges and risks when we go to Mars. What can go wrong when we go to Mars? And he um, bases this on extensive research and of course um, of searching contact to the space industry to, yeah, to write science fiction. But then again, why is it called science fiction? It is not called science fiction because it is um, being put into thousands of years away from our um, present uh, time. So um, it is, why is it called science fiction? Maybe because it's speculating on the possibilities, but the realistic possibilities of science fiction. What can uh, happen and develop when we take the existing knowledge and bring some fantasy and some bigger thoughts into it? This is, um, this is a quote. Um, and, um, the planet novels have been written by science fiction writers since the beginning, and it will continue, but they change when reality changes. And what was really interesting is another science fiction writer who is now uh, really recognized as a speaker for um, climate change, and um, King Stanley Robinson from the US, and he wrote this trilogy about transforming Mars into a second Earth. And he wrote a moon novel called Red Moon when the Chinese uh, succeeded to install um, a big infrastructure on the moon. So he's always interested in the technological possibilities, but the social implication and consequences. And this was interesting. He was being interviewed in a festival here in Berlin in last November for a climate cultures festival. And he said, um, about uh, writing science fiction, he said it's become a realism. So I think that near future science fiction is a kind of realism and it should shoot at a torch in order to hit because it flies so fast. I've also thought about my near future science fiction as opposed to the far future stories like Isaac Asimov's Foundation trilogy that is being a play that it plays in like, I think, in the year 30,000, that is like a far future story. So as opposed to the far future stories that I sometimes tell, but the near future stuff is the best realism of our time. Not just me, but the whole genre of near future science fiction is a kind of realism. So to be realistic, you have to write about climate change. Or maybe we can exchange or add civilian space development, can't we? So this... Um, evolution or these tendencies in near future science fiction is so interesting that we want to have like a single topic uh, tra um, track 
about like science fiction and space exploration on our convention. We're still seeking for writers and experts who are interested in it. And um, this near future science fiction, I think, is very interesting kind of subgenre of the subgenre because they are really interested in what happens next and what can be um, developed from the uh, contemporary time. So, yeah, okay, this was it. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you, Thank you man. Well, it's an, actually, it's thanks also for keeping the time. Yeah. Before I forget, also, I want to present on behalf of the organizers this beautiful uh, moment yeah. of Lee Kinder's uh, Bet Al. And uh, so we, uh, we can open the floor for, for yeah. questions. Mm -hmm. Yes, oh, yes, and we have our microphone astronaut uh, running <laughs> to allow communication <laughs> from us. Hello. Um, I think so you have read a lot of those space science fiction. And um, I wonder if you have read the three body problem from the UCC. The three body problem. Yeah. Um, what do you think about uh, the, the situation he has described in the books? Like, because it ended up pretty dark. Right, because um, there was another pretty um, popular TV show, um, I think from two years ago, or last year, it's called The Expanse, and it's also about um, the human has spread into the outer space, and then um, it, with the human politics, like, it, currently we have politics on the Earth and in the future we might have politics on different planets and then I wonder if you have read anything like someone has written that we have a better um, solution like political or economical or um, resource-wise solution to the uh, development in the space and uh, have a balance between the the space and the earth not that in the end we have um, a very huge conflict between the earth and space or something like this. Yeah, that, that's a huge um, discussion in this kind of literature and some people say or some science fiction writers say they are fed up of dystopias because dystopia is very common and very popular among science fiction writers. Uh, but on the other hand, in like classic science fiction, it was more like utopian. Uh, so you have to find like a middle way. But I, I um, uh, occupied myself with this topic um, in relation to the resources. Uh, some other um, speakers talked about this. And it's always like the problem, uh, what kind of people are allowed or will go to space? Would they like the scientists? That might be okay. There might be some problematic persons with um, like difficult characters, but how can they match uh, to each other? And what are like the um, the problems that will be there? And like with who has the right to um, bring the resources from asteroids to Earth? So there will still be hassle and arguments in space as well. And I think um, this kind of literature is so um, uh, like. A means to like prepare the people maybe for to find solution, but it's not easy. I... Yeah, I think we probably need to um, work on ourselves before we actually start to do this because um, I nobody wants to see another colonization like kind of system when we spread outside Earth. Yeah, and no, this classic, um, like with Heinlein, I also read like Heinlein, and he's sometimes um, problematic because some people say he's very militarist in the colonization. And can we use the word colonization or conquering when we go to space? Because it has bad implications. So we really have to watch our language as well when we write like manifestos or when we go up to space and uh, like to share this technology. But um, 
Yeah, it's really hard work to do. Yeah, I agree. Thank you. Other question? I, I have one following up uh, your point. Actually, um, now for the Space Renaissance, we want to promote civilian development in an inclusive way, mm -hmm. uh, also uh, uh, for the benefit of humanity. But does this make a good movie or a good science fiction novel? So we need uh, maybe some writers that can hype it, but also in an educative way, so we can show also that those values of hope, uh, this uh, also can generate a good uh, feel-good movie so that people would invest into the future, not only with weapon and so on, but uh, with uh, uh, harmonious development. So uh, can you help us to write a good uh, script for a movie? I don't know, but <laughs> that's the reason why I like abstain, um, abstain or I refrain from watching science fiction movies because I cannot really take all this spectacular and this um, big explosions. I don't really like this kind of big and catastrophic movies, so I switched to literature to find there some moral solutions. But maybe you can write out some competition and we can spread it in a science fiction yeah. scene. And then please write a utopia. How can we, uh, in a similar way, um, go to space? Yeah. Other than, I think there's an example like uh, Gravity, this movie. Mm. Huh? So it was uh, actually, new. Yeah, that's... it was a quite a feel good movie because yeah. it uh, was realistic and he talked about uh, the Kessler yeah, syndrome true. and you had a beautiful actress and uh, actors uh, with a very implausible scenario where uh, the, the actress lets a nice actor flow away. But um, uh, yeah, so that's, we could also generate interest with more realistic uh, movies that also capture new, new values of what would be a, a moon village or a humanity well represented. So, okay, so we have to form a committee of uh, script writing for uh, establishing new narrative for yeah, yeah, civilian yeah. Uh, development. So, if, and uh, if, you, if there are a few new references that we have that go in this uh, line, I think we should also uh, list them. So we should also have a yeah, nice exactly. set of references we can put on our stuff. website. Thank yeah, you thank very you. much. Uh, so I think we are exactly on time. Yeah, so. So, uh, so thanks, uh, Dominique. So the next uh, talk now is on the actuality of craft Eric vision. And it is uh, uh, given by Elga uh, Zup Laroche. Zep Laroche. Uh, Zep Laroche. <laughs> oh, okay. uh, Laroche. Uh, Laroche. Zep Laroche. And uh, um, yes, so that's uh, the floor is yours. And of course, uh, that's a very important vision to uh, culture and to see what are the current uh, development for that. Thank you. Well, I talk about <clears throat> Kraft Erik's vision and what makes life rich is when one has the good fortune to meet and work with a number of outstanding great minds of one time. One such person in my life was the great German American space pioneer Kraft Erike, whom I accompanied on a lecture tour through Germany in 1981, and who was on the advisory board of the Schiller Institute during the last years of his life. He was one of the great visionaries concerning man's identity as a space species, and he expressed that limitless optimism about the future of mankind which only the great geniuses of humanity, of human history portray. Given his extraordinary prescience of the fundamental challenges in space science, which are only becoming obvious today, he deserves to be more recognized by several orders of magnitude. Kraft Erike was born in Berlin on March 24th, 1917. When 12 years old, he saw the movie by Fritz Lang, Woman in the Moon, which together with the work of Hermann Obert was the inspiring experience that would shape his entire life. From that moment on, he would immerse himself in books about astronomy, flight mechanics, drive technology, and soon he started to design models of spacecraft. And <clears throat> he, then he became a prolific writer for technical journals. In 1938, he founded the Society for Space Research, 
together with Franz <clears throat> Kaiser. He studied at the Technical University in Berlin, listened to Hans Geiger and Werner Heisenberg, and acquired a broad knowledge in natural sciences, the evolution of life and the biosphere. From the standpoint of the evolution of life on the planet Earth, it was evident to him that the next natural phase of human evolution would be the settlement of the human species, first in nearby space and then eventually in the entire solar system and beyond. Interrupted by the convocation to the army during the war in 1940, he was ordered from the Eastern Front to Peenemünde because some of his patents concerning rocket designs found the attention of army services. There he worked together with Dr. Walter Thiel and Werner von Braun. He was tasked to investigate the application of the newly discovered nuclear fission te technology for rocket propulsion. After the war, he was one of the German scientists who moved per the initial Operation Paperclip to the US, where he worked with rocket specialists first in Fort Bliss in New Mexico, then in Huntsville, Alabama. There he became the chief of the Department for Gas Dynamics before moving to the private aviation firm Bell Aircraft. Later, he worked for General Dynamics. Kraft developed a number of applications for the Atlas rocket. His most revolutionary technical development was the Centaur rocket, an upper stage, the first hydrogen fueled vehicle for which he earned the nickname father of the Centaur rocket. This energetic addition to any other rocket opened up the solar system to mankind, and it has carried everything from unmanned surveyor craft to the manned Apollo mission to moon, from the Mariner missions to Mars to the Voyager, the Voyager spacecraft. In 1957, Kraft published the quote, anthropology of astronautics, which point, pointed to the extraordinary significance of space research and travel for the sense of identity of the human species. And therefore as a concept to find solutions to seemingly unsolvable problems in the political and strategic situation. He wrote, the concept of space travel carries with it enormous impact because it challenges men on all practical, all fronts of his physical and spiritual existence. The idea of traveling to other celestial bodies reflects to the highest degree, the independence and agility of the human mind. It lends ultimate dignity to men's technical and scientific endeavors. Above all, it touches on the philosophy of his very existence. As a result, the concept of space travel disregards national borders, refuses to recognize differences of historical or ethnological origin, and penetrates the fiber of the one sociological or political greed as fast as that of the next. As a technical concept, astronautics is all embracing and more revolutionary than anything conceived so far, including even atomic technology. As a scientific concept, it is bound to stimulate and rejuvenate practically all fields of astronomy to zoology. Its sociological and political implications are such that future generations may well describe as cautious even the boldest predictions of our time. Because of this, space travel holds perhaps the greatest general appeal for our complex and divided world. It seems to promise less immediate gain, material gains than atomic technology. Yet, or perhaps therefore, its spiritual appeal is extremely powerful, symbolizing as it does that man, after all, has not yet lost his capability of cutting the Gordian knot, of exploding old notions which, which retard his development and of overcoming seemingly invincible physical obstacles. If it can be done here, it can eventually also be done in other segments of our life today, where man seems to be hopelessly and perpetually deadlocked. A feeling of enthusiasm 
and genuine interest seems to prevail among all those who deal with space flight and astronautics, school children learning about it, congressmen allotting money for it, political leaders of the East and West praising their nation's contributions to its progress. And last but not least, scientists and engineers blazing the trail towards its eventual accomplishment. Well, while the present day realities like the Wolf event Amendment in the United States or recent accusations that China is about to take over the moon seem to contradict such an optimistic perspective. It is also a fact that if one leaves the space scientists and astronauts among themselves, that feeling of enthusiasm and genuine interest that Kraft Erika speaks about clearly prevails and gives a pretaste of what will be a natural cooperation of representatives of the human species of the future. Just think a couple of hundred, thousand of, or millions years ahead. And that's what we should be thinking about. Do you really think that we will be still squabbling among each other like a bunch of snotty nosed children fighting over their toys? This is why the lofty principles laid out by Kraft Erika are a useful reminder that humanity is the unique species capable of reason. And out of that follows the ability to again and again come up with solutions which are on a higher level than that on which the problems arose. So he stated beautifully in what he called the three fundamental laws of astronautics. First law, nobody and nothing under natural laws of the universe impose any limitation on man except man himself. Second law, not only the earth, but the entire solar system and as much of the universe as he can reach under the laws of nature are man's rightful field of activity. Third law, by expanding through the universe, man fulfills his destiny as an element of life endowed with the power of reason and the wisdom of the moral law within himself. He calls the first law a declaration of independence from uncritically accepted conditions from a past and principally different pre-technological world clinging to humanity. And he explicitly cites the US Declaration of Independence, which represented the rejection of empire for the sake of the public as a proof that such an axiomatic break with a flawed thinking is actually possible. The way Kraft situated the third law in that space operations have an anthropological character puts him in total cohesion with the tradition of the platonic humanist tradition of Nicolaus of Kuhs, Johannes Kepler, Gottfried Wilhelm Leibniz and Vladimir Vernadsky. Namely, that the idea of the inner cohesion of the laws of the macrocosm and the microcosm and the increasing dominance of the noosphere over the biosphere. The fact that man is the only source of intelligent life known to us so far, Kraft says, gives him, quote, the right to expand, to develop, and to enrich the foundations of his existence to the limits of his capability. And it is the continued problem solving of living elsewhere in the solar system or even in interstellar space that gives space flight its ultimate anthropological meaning. While it is totally normal today to talk about lunar industrialization, he was one of the most original and far-sighted pioneers in this endeavor. In the development of the moon, he saw the first step of the extraterrestrialization of mankind, which will change and develop mankind to a more advanced stage. He describes how on earth the biosphere came first and then through evolution, mankind developed. On the moon, it will be reverse. Men will arrive first, and only then the conditions are created for life to exist there. This was beautifully demonstrated by China's Chang'e 4 lunar lander mission, which got the first plant to ever germinate and sprout on another world, inaugurating a new era for life in space. Kraft regarded the moon as the seventh continent of Earth, 
And in the 1970s, he elaborated a detailed study for the industrialization of the moon in five phases. In the first phase, goods are exclusively transported from Earth to the moon. In the third phase, goods retrieved back to the Earth. And in the fifth, life and production on the moon are not self-sufficient, uh, but a city, next slide please, called Selenopolis, becomes the capital of the moon we're showing, civil... We're showing you. Oh, the, yes. the, you, you have a slide, the, the picture, or the Yeah, text. it's in the script I send you. Okay. Let me read it. Okay. I'm showing you because it's all text, so it's better to see you than the text, I think, for, for uh, the people. Okay, okay. <laughs> but I send you the picture, but, anyway. Yeah. Uh, the picture shows the energy uh, Selenopolis, which becomes the capital of the new moon civilization and becomes the support basis for new colonies in the solar system. This picture shows the energy supply for the city coming from a tokamak fusion reactor. The design of the city is expandable, so it can grow with the increase of the population and its activities. The canopies go from 500 meters up to several kilometers. Um, there you see actually uh, children skating on ice. It's terrible. GPS, it's autonomous, you know? I cannot control it. Okay. Is that? Yeah, that's the Okay. Uh, so Kraft anticipated uh, that the different climates on Earth will be recreated. Cold winters, warm agricultural areas, dry or subtropical climates. In the first phase of industrialization, the energy source would be high the high temperature reactor followed by thermonuclear fusion. He proposed to use the first generation deuterium tritium fusion reactors to breed the rare isotope helium-3 in order to realize the technologically more challenging deuterium helium fusion, one that could reach a higher energy efficiency. He could not yet know that on the moon, there are significant amounts of helium-3 and that Chinese space scientists are planning to import this back to the Earth in order to fuel fusion reactors here. After Kraft Erika had died on December 11th, 1984, the Los Angeles Times wrote about him that he had fascinated many audiences when he was featured in TV or radio programs talking about building swimming pools on the moon despite the low gravity uh, or about in interstellar spaceships that could make our galaxy the backyard of mankind. For Kraft, the goal was not a village on the moon, nor even a city on Mars. Rather, he thought in terms of the long range, long range aspect of interstellar exploration of the universe. In an unpublished book, he considers relativistic interstellar flight investigating Einstein's special and general relativity. Given the fact that recently the proof was found that Einstein's assumptions about gravitational waves are correct and his theory that in the center of every galaxy there are black holes, this means it is proven that we are living in a relativistic universe. What that will mean for the possibility of interstellar space travel and possibly even beyond is mind boggling. But it is exactly this kind of bold thinking in hypothesis as outlandish and bold as it may appear to be at the time, which is characteristic of the human species and which separates us from all other living creatures known so far. Once again, Kraft's far ahead and unblocked thinking should be an inspiration. Naturally, from this standpoint of limitless perfectibility of human creativity in an anti-entropically developing universe, Kraft recognized the terrible implication of the emerging zero growth ideology as it appeared in the beginning of the 1970s with the Club of Rome and the resulting green ecology movement. He recognized the intellectual fraud of Meadows and Forrester who in their book, Limits to Growth, had completely left out the role of science and technology in the definition of what a resource is and pointed to the qualitative 
difference between propagation and growth, a differentiation which has completely disappeared for the green movement today. Kraft stated for them, the environment, the environment of life of man is a closed system, limited to earth, not for me. The field of activity of man is today as little a closed sphere as it was a flat disk earlier. The report Global 2000 is a warmed up version of the same nonsense, contains obvious misinformation and misjudges as its notorious predecessor, the human ability for limitless growth. Growth is in contrast to mere propagation, an increase in knowledge, wisdom and capacity to grow in a new way. For Kraft Erike, the idea of space travel was the most logical and lofty consequence of the ideal of the Renaissance, which put man in the context and in an active context with the cosmos, building on the most noble traditions of the ancient classics. He showed the way how by lifting the eyes to the star and by working to make them the home of humanity, man can realize both his innate dignity and the age of reason. Last slide, please. Yeah. In the age, uh, in the year following Kraft Erika's death, the Schiller Institute <clears throat> held a memorial in his honor. It would be wonderful if the international space community would do it again. Thank you. Thank you. Please stay here. Oh, okay. Because, uh, okay, in the good tradition, we want also to give you as a tribute from our event and from uh, the legacy of Professor Herman, this oh, book. Thank you very much. <laughs> but also, we want to address uh, some uh, questions if there are some uh, uh, in the audience. Of course, um, we are very inspired by Kraft Erika. And uh, so, some of the, uh, the items you mentioned. Uh, Okay, space renaissance, <laughs> what give our name? And uh, so also his, his vision, the positive vision, uh, also counteracting some of this idea of a closed world with no technical progress. I think uh, we, we are witnessing that clearly this is changing the way we can evolve as a civilization. So clearly uh, that's very important uh, uh, to us. We uh, thank you very much uh, for uh, summarizing also some of his legacy, but now also, who are the thinkers that are developing beyond uh, uh, the, the vision of craft and research? So what are the next uh, steps uh, to, to make progress? Well, I think... Um, oh, sorry, yeah. Oh. Okay, yeah we have to... Well, I think ESA is uh, underfunded. Um, there are still good cooperation between Roscosmos and uh, NASA, despite the political problems. <laughs> But I think uh, the Chinese impressed me the most because while they started uh, space travel very late, uh, they have made uh, breakthroughs. You know, the whole idea that the Chinese are stealing technology, they have disproven by putting uh, something on the far side of the moon where nobody was before. So the question is, where could they steal it from when they are the first one? So I think the Chinese are definitely, uh, you know, they also had this Mars mission uh, last February together with the UAE and also the United States. I'm also very impressed by the leader of the UAE mm -hmm. space program because in six years, you know, she, uh, they, the whole yeah, team yeah. developed uh, the Mars, uh, Mars mission. And I think, you know, now we are at a new frontier because of uh, possibly life on Mars, places being found. Mm -hmm. So I think it's a very exciting moment. Yes, yeah, certainly. So clearly, I mean, but uh, it's true that uh, since uh, Kraft and Rick, uh, uh, visionary uh, ideas, also our world has changed. And you mentioned, uh, okay, so the development of emerging space uh, countries like uh, UAE, uh, really the, the acceleration of the activities uh, in the China, uh, the fact that uh, of course, we have also to keep some of the top level principles, which is uh, how uh, space expansion can serve uh, no benefits uh, for all. So well, now we are talking about sustainable development goals. But what I was, I'm a bit surprised is uh, the fact that, so are we already ready for this interstellar expansion or should we do it really with uh, consolidating the, the next step? So 
you know, the moon, we can uh, use it as a continent. So let's also take the time to develop some activities on the moon continent. Then we'll have Mars and others. And uh, before we go interstellar, uh, there's a lot of technical challenge. Uh, yes, obviously, but you have to think ahead, you know, because the vision for the future is what inspires the steps tomorrow and the day after tomorrow. Obviously, we need thermonuclear fusion as propulsion to even think about interstellar uh, travel. But I think, you know, what is, um, what, what is necessary is the idea that man is a space species. And Kraft Erika even thought that it's not just the solar system, but, you know, given technological progress, we don't even know what it will be. Um, you know, that it's possible to even leave our galaxy. And given the fact that uh, uh, Hubble telescope has discovered two trillion galaxies uh, for mankind to occupy space, you know, I think it, 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 it boggles your mind, but that's a good thing. I think we are not limited to, to uh, I think the fantastic thing about space is that it completely uh, rejects the green ideology because we are not living in a closed system. You know, we are living in a, in a system where, as Kraft correctly said, men's creativity can overcome any challenge. And that optimism is what is lacking. You know, the last time you had any politician who was talking like that was John F. Kennedy. Um, he, he had this idea that, that men's creativity can solve any challenge. And nowadays people are so pessimistic. And so downtrodden, you know, especially in Europe. I was just talking with the young lady from China that in Asia, it's completely different. The Asian cultures right now have a very optimistic idea that the Europeans will soon be fossils in the museum of people who didn't make it if we don't go back to the ideas like Kraft Erika. Good, so we would agree with that. I see that we have to bring hope. So yes. I still have the hope we can educate politician, we can also involve them. So possibly some of our space uh, young professional, please also become politicians so that you can change the world. I know some colleagues, uh, I mean, I, I have some colleague astronauts, they went into European Parliament. So they can also start to motivate us first for a knowledge based society that is using facts to make a decision. And also, uh, let's uh, see as space is, is such an important part of our life. Uh, also, uh, the economical, social aspect of the uh, space makes that the politician cannot ignore it. Otherwise, I'm going to switch off all the spacecraft for one week, <laughs> and then they will know what they, what they need uh, into space. But um, yes, yeah, so um, any other questions on uh, uh, how modern is this vision, but also how we can continue also based on the, the, the society we have today. And I think we also in the meantime, we have got Europe, Created. So there should be also some some good uh, energy uh, for, for Europe. Yes, uh, Adriano. No, I have uh, one question because I always try to bring uh, back all the vision to what we have to do today. Uh, okay. Yes. It's my recommendation when they <laughs> yeah. don't observe. <laughs> uh, so, is, is, uh, um, Agreeing 100% with Kraft Kerke that the only limit is the universe. So we don't have limits and we have the right to go there because we are the only intelligent spaces. And we have the right to contaminate other environments with our life because we are contaminated by, by the universe, whoever, because comets exceeded the life on Earth. We, we, didn't, we, we didn't have birth on earth we come from this we, we are coming from the stars so why we don't we cannot take back the life to the stars so having said all that and the great vision of uh, going outside of this galaxy and so on in your opinion what should we do before 2030 to avoid the civilization collapse and to take profit of the lunch window the historical lunch window that we have I think this is the very important. There is a philosophical view and there is a political view. So, from the point of view of space policy, what it is very urgent to do before 2030? Well, I think the most urgent thing is to avoid that we self destroy each other because we are very close to World War III. Yeah. 
uh, much closer than most people want to even contemplate. And uh, if I think about that, I have sleepless nights. You know, I wake up in the middle of the night and I have sweats uh, <clears throat> because, you know, there are people in, in the world right now who think that you can win a limited nuclear war. And that's a completely mm, insane crazy. idea. Yeah. So I think what would be necessary is to mobilize the young people much more than it's being done. You remember when the Apollo 50s anniversary was, there was a festivities all over the world. People were very optimistic. And I think it's that kind of optimism that space cooperation is the one area where you can overcome these problems. And we have to have a mass movement of people who talk about that. You know, we should okay. mobilize the astronauts and other space scientists to go to the schools, to go to the universities, you know, and talk about this. I think we need a, an, a popular uprising discussing the importance of space to make sure that we become the immortal species. Okay. Because I believe that in the tradition of the philosophy of, of uh, Kraft Erika, mankind is the only immortal species, yeah. potentially. Potentially, yes. Potentially. So if we conquer other bodily uh, celestial bodies, um, you know, then we can, even if something terrible happens to the Earth in two billion years from now because of the developments on the sun, we, we will continue to live. But we have to make sure we live the next several yes. weeks, months, years. Exactly. And therefore, I think we need a popular discussion about the danger and how to overcome it. Mm -hmm. And I think the, the vision of the astronauts when they are looking from the ISS down to the Earth, it was mentioned by several speakers this morning, the, the vision changes, you know, and Kraft Erika, he would tell us always that, you know, there is a change in the identity of people. Because he said when he traveled or when he immigrated with his wife uh, and children from Germany to the United States, he had one mindset, but the children who grew up in the United States had already a mixed mindset, a different change. And the children, the children of the children who grew up in the United States, again, had a completely different paradigm in their thinking. And he used that as a pedagogical way to describe what will happen to the identity of man when he is on the moon or on yep. Mars people will change. It's like infrastructure, you know, infrastructure, you know, in the beginning, people thought that you die when you go quicker than 30 kilometers per hour with a train. But now in China, people are making experiments with the maglev uh, trains going 600 kilometers uh, per hour, and they're not dying. <laughs> As a matter of fact, it will make it everything more efficient. So if infrastructure changes the identity of, of man. And I think it is that which we have to evoke. Okay. Excellent. So, well, thank you. We are exactly on time. So as a good rocket uh, uh, engineer, <laughs> scientist and uh, philosopher. So, uh, uh, and clearly, okay, you mentioned, okay, human have this vocation, but also they have this duty to save guard the planet, uh, to say also take care of the other species and so biodiversity because we don't want to go alone also to, uh, to, to space. We want also to go with a good uh, uh, zoo <laughs> together uh, with, with us. So, um, and of course there are important uh, questions. Uh, so what will be our future? But now the near time future is that we go for lunch. <laughs> <laughs> so I think that we have exactly the time for lunch, which is uh, one o'clock and we will reconvene at uh, 14.30. Uh, sharp uh, because we'll have a, a remote uh, contribution from Dr. Robert Zubrin developing the solar system, the task for today and not only for the future, the president of the Mars Society. So, okay, see you at lunch and uh, this afternoon. We have also in parallel so um, a session which is in a German language that will start at also 14.30 and uh, this will be in a kleiner Ersaal. So the small lecture hall, which is uh, uh, nearby. Okay, so have a good uh, lunch and uh, see you this afternoon. Thank you very much. <laughs>